Welcome, everyone. I am so, so sad. Holding back tears as we speak. I don't know what I'm going to do. And they're now uploading hours. hours. Nine <laughs> hours. If it takes us nine hours, maybe there is a lot that was wrong. When he's writing about the Bible, it becomes painfully clear that he hasn't done the work in a lot of the critical theories. But this is what makes throw it up against the wall and see what sticks apologetics so frustrating. Yeah. yeah. No, Michael. I think the only people that interpreted Kip is saying that are you guys. Honestly. Like, what's that? Right? What the hell did I say? Why, hello, my fellow apes. I hope you are well. Welcome back to our refutation, our response to inspiring philosophy, otherwise known as Michael Jones, and uh, Dr. David Falk, Dr. Joshua Bowen, and Dr. Kip Davis. Thank you both for joining me again. Looking forward to this. Oh, man. Thank you for having us back. Thanks, Stephen. It's good to be here. I think the first thing I want to discuss is actually just share something with you, and actually to everyone in the audience. It's a new ringtone. I've put the MP3 down below. Just check this out. This is beautiful. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta finish crying. I get it all out. I have a lot of tears for this. <laughs> all right, there we go. I got the now. <laughs> what the? F okay, so what you just saw there <laughs> is a response that Michael and David have already done to us. Our first episode. Uh, with fake crying, a very, very interesting approach, very interesting style that they're going for. Uh, but most importantly, a really good ring tune. So you can check that out in the description. <laughs> <laughs> I did think it was funny. I did think it was funny. Um, it was, it, it, it felt odd, but I thought, thought the, it was funny. It was I do appreciate the humor. I'm I'm looking forward to potentially responding to some of the things they said in there. Um, but uh, of course, we have so much to go through the first, and they're they're already very upset that we're taking this much time to go through so many mistakes. But that's just the way that it works. It's uh, Brandolini's law. Very minor mistakes, Stephen. Very <laughs> minor mistakes. Very very minor mistakes. It was funny that so, I mean, I and I understand why they did. Uh, the people in the audience take it this way. But people took this nine hours of response thing. Nine hours. To mean that we did a nine hour stream, <laughs> which I mean, uh, I have five kids, people like uh, there's there's like no way on earth I could do something straight for nine hours besides work. So, uh, yeah, not uh, not a nine hour stream. It's also like a catch t like 22. Like you're going to you're going to. You're going to lose if you don't respond and lose if you do respond. So if they like issue all of these different claims and you don't respond, oh, it's because you just can't. Scholars just don't look at my stuff. Whereas if you do respond, they go, whoa, nine hours. Like, what's going on? Why are you responding like this? Unbelievable. Obviously, what I'm saying is true. Otherwise, they wouldn't spend nine hours on it. This just isn't how it works. But I guess it worked on his audience to, to emphasize a bit of a time frame. Yeah, and if something... I mean, the other way to frame this is that if it takes us nine hours, maybe there is a lot that was wrong. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what do they think we were doing for nine hours? Just what? Like, exactly. There was, there was reading out from their own scholars. It was, it was showing them where they were wrong and in, in how they were accusing you of quote mining while quote mining. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a mess. But I do appreciate we got a new ringtone. Now, Michael um, did say in that video that he knows how to respond to us going forward. And I thought I'd play a clip of that because I think it, even though we're dealing with his older stuff, I do think it's important for the dialectic and how, how this stuff works. Welcome, everyone. I am so, so sad, so stressed out. <laughs> I am holding back tears as we speak. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Michael actually knows exactly what to do, and that is to avoid focusing on the facts and instead engaging in mockery and psychological tactics. On the one hand, I appreciate it. It's funny. But on the other hand, like this, make no mistake, this is what you do when, you, when you're being, your feet are being held to the fire. And um, one thing to know in what he was doing, and this is something we noted before, uh, him and Falk accuse us of poisoning the well, of gaslighting all while they're doing the same. It's blatant hypocrisy, and it's done through the medium of projection. 
Um, if you're interested in facts, they're always bulleted below. They're, you can always see them in the timestamps. I mean, we're going to get to them in just a sec. But it's worth noting that this is becoming more of a control of the narrative. But if you're interested in the facts, just focus on the facts because we, we got them coming. Uh, that's a real life picture of the real psychological state of Michael from our response. Um, I had to get a friend to capture that from behind the scenes. Uh, he's not <laughs> triggered at all. And they're now uploading hours. <laughs> Hours. Nine hours. <laughs> Nine hours. <laughs> How <laughs> triggered do you have to be to, about this? And they're not even done. They're not even they're done. Not they're done. Even no. Oh, what? Oh, what an enormous waste of time. So I got to say that in terms of uh, convincing them, yeah, it may be a waste of time. I'm sure it is. <laughs> in terms of just trying to provide for people uh, where we think they went wrong. No, it's not a waste of time. And as we were just saying before, dedicating a lot of time to things like this, um, this is actually a good sign. It, it's like you're, you're taking what they've got and you're issuing responses and you're being meticulous and detailed about it. So it does take time. If someone goes on to an apologist show, is presented as an expert, acts as an expert, and makes a litany of mistakes over the hour, then it's going to take a lot of time to be able to unpack those mistakes. He's kind of betting that someone won't take the time to unpack them. So, um, yeah, it, it is going to take time. That is, that's how this stuff works. And it works in their benefit, knowing that it takes a lot of time. I mean, cards on the table here. The, part of the reason that it takes so much time, and <laughs> compared to what you see on screen, the time that we spend recording, that's little compared to the time that we have to take to do the research. And, and here's why I think this is so frustrating. We're going to talk about this one, I think, tonight. But this comment about the Amalekites, you know, this sort of throwaway line about the Amalekites, that they are the, the Luca. You know, w <laughs> we heard it. It was like, well, that's some bullshit. Then we, we contacted... Uh, several subject matter experts that work in the period, and we said, "Any is is this even an option in the field?" Nope, never heard of it. Yeah, we were looking too, right? Like, I yeah. think one of the first things we did, even even prior to contacting uh, some of the people we did, was to start digging through primary source material and through uh through through the secondary literature to see i mean is this anything is anybody uh talking about this and making this connection and how are they how are they uh making this connection with uh with the word like uh uh amaleki and uh and deriving people of the luka out of that so I, and we'll we'll talk about that but it yeah and that takes work right and that can take days of work sometimes. But this is the this is the fundamental point because even though the temptation in that moment is to go, well, that's bullshit and and I know that it is, you know, I think intellectual rigor, honesty, I don't know, says, okay, maybe Falk has done some work here, right? Maybe Falk, maybe he's got a paper in the wings. Maybe this is something he's actually spent a lot of time on. And maybe this is like somebody's, you know, level of like a, a dissertation, right? Maybe he's just waiting to come out with it. So so then what we have to do, and you're going to hear it in our response tonight, uh, is to say, okay, look, here's what scholars are saying about this. Here's what, you know, they they suggest about the etymology of this term. Here's where we see the Luca coming from. This is where we see the Amalekites coming from. And so it doesn't seem like anybody's saying this in the field. However, if Falk wants to put forward this, this assertion, right, wants to assert this, that's great, but we need to see an argument, right? Until we see an argument, until this comes out in a peer-reviewed paper, or or just just the argument itself. It's just a claim. It's just a, it's just a claim. But even even that groundless yeah. claim. But to get to that point, this is I hate to say it like this, 
But this is what makes throw it up against the wall and see what sticks apologetics so fucking frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't just say, like when I did all these these slavery responses, and people would say like, oh, you know, uh, foreigners, they just, uh, you know, they, they, they connected to the household. And this is something that happens in the ancient Near East. It's like, okay, I, I can just say, yeah, that's, that's not right. right. That's not what's going on in Leviticus 25. But that's not intellectually honest. That's not rigorous. So what I have to do is I have to actually go read through the text again with that, you know, in mind, looking at the text that way, go through and read the secondary literature again, and just cover all of my bases. That's what it means to be careful with this stuff. And in the end, it's like you say, okay, I've just spent two weeks prepping all of this for this 35-minute response video. Here you go, only to have them go, yeah, 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 okay, 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 but what about this one? And it's like, <laughs> yeah. <sighs> So <laughs> more spaghetti. Yeah, right. Hopefully this one sticks. Hopefully you tire too much and you can't do another nine hours of refutation and yeah. therefore it, you know it stays on the wall. Yeah. No, you're you're absolutely correct. That is uh it's a great frustration with counter apologetics in general. And when it comes to uh doing that research and presenting the refutation, as you said, you could just stand up and go, look, this is absolute nonsense. Show me. Show me where he's getting this information from. Get him to do it. And that, that works to some extent because it's putting the burden of proof back on where it should be. But when he, especially when he's making definitively false claims, you don't just want to tell the audience they're false. You want to go, look, let me walk you through how you figure this out. Let me read this quote, which took me hours to dig up. Let me read about it. By the way, there's like four or five words in there that need unpacking. So allow me to unpack those words because they are uh, contextual and uh, you're going to need to understand what they mean according to the scholars. But you may not believe in in the way I'm telling you. So I actually need to reference another scholar to be able to back that up. And like all of this just takes time. And it really is uh, that case of Brandolini's law. It's just, it's the bullshit asymmetry principle. It just takes more time to debunk claims than it does to make them. And so, yes, it does take time to debunk stuff. But if people are interested in truth, if that's their uh, pursuit, then that shouldn't be an issue. That should be a perfectly fine thing to do. It's ridiculous. Now, here's what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to look at their video. There's not a lot of substance. There's like a like they they spend like most of like the first hour trying very hard to poison the well and just prime their audience to think that we have no integrity that we're these evil bad apologists. We're gonna skip over most of that because I don't care. If okay, so Michael says that we called them evil. These evil bad apologists. That we said that they lack integrity. We have no integrity. Could have played those clips to his audience. Uh, could have shown that context uh, rather than just telling them. That's one thing. Um, and again, notice that he's he's basic. He is poisoning the well. He is poisoning his audience against us while accusing us of doing it. Trying very hard to poison the well. This is just WWE style spectacle, as you said last time, Josh. It's 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 a complete mess. But this is the way that the discourse works. But yeah, so with that, what I'm getting at is that I don't actually anticipate that they're going to respond to any of the hard hitting refutations that we give. Um, especially where they're giving themselves license to only respond to things that they are they consider substantive, which to them are going to be things like, I don't know, you miss say something or something along those lines, rather than the actual objections that are being pushed through, which is something that you both emphasized in our first response. They hyper fixated on certain small points. But that's something that they do. So it's, it's more it's more of that coming up, more of that uh, going to happen. But um, but yeah. We've already had a response. It'll be fun to see if they respond to what we have to say in this one. <laughs> okay, so returning to the topic, here's Michael appearing as an expert on Gavin Ortland's show, who's another apologist, so another apologist, uh, apologetic platform. And here Michael is confidently issuing statements about the conquest of Canaan, history, archaeology, that are simply false. Trying very hard to poison the well. Maybe that counts as poisoning the well, but we've already shown that in the previous episode. But we're getting the context back on screen. Did the conquest of Canaan actually happen? What is the overall state of scholarship on a question like that? Well, it seems to be shifting more in the direction of historicity. Uh, it definitely seems to be moving away from the old Deaver or Finkelstein idea that this was all mythology written later. Now, that still seems to be the consensus, especially among critical scholars, for sure. But the evidence overwhelmingly supports an historical conquest. 
Uh, a lot of what you're going to hear is that, well, there was no evidence of widespread mass destruction throughout Canaan. And Kenneth Kitchen, Old Testament scholar, says, duh, uh, because that's not what Joshua says. It says three sites were burned, Jericho, Ai, and Hazor. The rest were supposed to be used by the Israelites. They were supposed to just sort of come in, kick out the evil inhabitants, and take over. So we shouldn't expect to see a major difference. One of the things I, I didn't notice at first, but upon rewatching, I've noticed, is that he's blatantly contradicting himself here because he's claiming that most scholars, especially critical ones, view the conquest of Canaan as a myth. Now, that still seems to be the consensus, especially among critical scholars. Yeah, he insists that there's obvious evidence that it happened. The evidence overwhelmingly supports an historical conquest. Which is to say that, you know, scholarship has shifted towards it. That's what he says. Scholarship has shifted towards it. it seems to be shifting more in the direction of historicity. It's like pick a lane, my dude. You're actually speaking out of both sides of your mouth here. Um, and the implication here is that non-Christians are simply ignoring or rejecting clear evidence. Yes. And that aligns yes. with... Obvious, mm. obvious, obvious evidence. He says the, uh, the overwhelming evidence shows that a conquest of Canaan happened. And I, I mean, it's, it does raise really serious questions of what he thinks scholars are doing if in the face of this overwhelming evidence, everybody is just going, yeah, yeah but... It's very much fitting that narrative, right? That narrative of um, you don't need to trust atheists, you don't need to trust disbelievers, uh, they don't actually look at this stuff with earnest. Mm -hmm. And that's what that statement is ex it's implicitly stating. It's the evidence is here. It's, it's really there. But these scholars, just they just don't agree with it. They don't like it. It's... I, to, to think that that's... It just just think of the probability of like that happening. That alone should make you smell a bit of ball in what he's saying. This is the next clip. We're going to see Kip. Oh, by the way, I, I learned one thing from uh, watching their response. He says Dr. David Falk every is, time he says- Really? Dr. Falk. Dr. Falk. Dr. Falk. Dr. Falk. Dr. Falk. Dr. Falk. So I, I realized I should be saying Dr. Joshua Boeing, Dr. Kip Davis, and I should be doing it every time. It's just, as an atheist, you kind of get used to having the scholars on your side, so you just <laughs> use like first names. Whereas when you're an apologist, it's really quite rare, even if you can only get one that's in a tangential field, you must refer to them as doctor. Or even if they've got a demon like Frank Turek, you must say doctor. So- you know, I do apologize for not keeping that up. So, yes, we're going to see Dr. Kip Davis responding to Michael on this topic on our friend Paula G's channel, which uh, I still think William Lane Craig gets that right. His name is actually Paulogio. Paulogio. Well, this depends very much on how Michael and by extension Kenneth are defining mass destruction, because as I read the text, this is just wrong. Yes, Jericho, Ai, and Hazor are the only cities mentioned in the text specifically as having been burned. That's in Joshua 6:24, 8, 28, 11, 11, and 13. There were actually either seven or eight cities in which the Israelites were commanded to destroy everything. That is, they were to kill everything and everyone alive, indiscriminate killing, and render everything else of value either useless or unto Yahweh's sanctuary. A few things. Now, the reason I called focus to how many of the cities were burned, the reason I called that a distraction is because I think it really detracts from what is presented in the book of Joshua in favor of a more cherry-picked view of the archaeology and the history. So I intentionally mentioned the significance of Cherem warfare here because I think this more directly reveals the larger purpose of the Joshua narrative, which is to describe the eradication of like Canaanite people, yes, but along with that is Canaanite culture, meaning also the complete removal of Canaanites. In those places where the term is used to describe the conquest of a given city, the expectation of the reader is that the entire population was slaughtered. This is actually part of the description of the destruction of many of these cities. And I think I'll, we'll get into those in uh, following maybe another clip. Mm. But uh, I'm just going to quote here from Jacob Milgram. And this is from his commentary on Leviticus, speaking of the term Haram. Uh, he says this term, 
is generally rendered as prescription or ban. It can be defined as the status of that which is separated from common use or contact, either because it is proscribed as an abomination to God or because it is consecrated to him. And he's citing Greenberg there as well. Uh, in effect, it is the ultimate in dedication. Uh, in the priestly view, Cherem may never be redeemed. Cherem land belongs permanently to the sanctuary. Cherem animals, if pure, must be sacrificed on the altar, and if impure, become, like land, the permanent property of the sanctuary. The Cherem persons, for example, Canaanite slaves, prisoners of war, must be killed. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's from Leviticus 23 to 27, page 24 to 18. So he goes on to say that in the Deuteronomistic history, which um, the, the book of Joshua is usually included in that, the word more specifically means that the population is destroyed as well as its cult objects, but as but its cities and property may be expropriated as spoils, as in Deuteronomy 2, 35 and, and 3, verse 7. That's from page 2418. So the important point I wanted to make is that the comprehensive scale of, of destruction envisioned in Joshua does not align with the archaeological record, which does not show any consistent perceptible change in culture and makeup of the Southern Levant population at the end of the Bronze Age, when uh, these things were supposed to have happened and i don't know if if we have time but there's i mean there's a few more things i did some i did some some further reading today one of the books that i really like it's a little dated uh but i still really like uh and killebrew's biblical peoples and ethnicity an archaeological study of egyptians canaanites philistines and early israel 1300 to 1100 bce so, and just kind of going over uh, what a scholarly picture of Canaan at the time of the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age looks like and how scholars evaluate this kind of stuff. So I, I've got a, a few sections that I thought I would just read through here. Um, speaking, first of all, about the book of Joshua, she says, Joshua 1 to 12 describes a successful campaign against the Canaanites by a united Israel. Joshua's military conquest begins in the center of the country, continues with a campaign to the south, and concludes in the north, culminating in the conflagration of Chatzor, the head of all the kingdoms. With the notable exception of Chatzor, this account finds little historical or archaeological support. Both the internal biblical contradictions and these external discrepancies between the conquest account and the archaeological evidence reflect the passage of time between Israel's proto-historical period and the actual composition of texts. Consensus exists that whatever its sources, either oral and or written, the conquest account as narrated in the book of Joshua is historically problematic and should be treated with caution. She goes on to say, the book of Judges presents an alternative account of early Israel's history and the settlement of the tribes. Here, Israelite settlement is depicted as gradual, fragmented, and fraught with difficulties. Contrary to the claim in Joshua 11, 16 to 23, that Canaan had been conquered and the land allocated to the 12 tribes, according to Judges, the Canaanites were still a group to be reckoned with. Consequently, there were periodic violent encounters between coalitions of various Israelite tribes and the indigenous populations. Scholars traditionally have given more credence to the judge's account. So you hear that, right? Scholars recognize some pretty considerable inconsistencies between the narrative of the book of Joshua and the narrative of the book of Judges. And by and large, most say if there's an historical kernel, most of this stuff, most of this stuff seems to align more closely to what's happening in the book of Judges than it does 
the unilateral conquest in the book of Joshua. Yeah. Yeah. Scholars traditionally have given more credence to the judge's account, in part because critical analysis of the book point to a more complex stratigraphic layering of the textual source materials, some of which are believed to date to the pre-monarchical period. So, but she goes through in her book the 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 pieces of archaeological evidence within the region, which point to what's which which illustrate kind of what's going on uh at the end of the bronze age and the beginning of the iron age and so here i'll just read a little bit more the archaeological evidence though fragmentary contributes to our understanding of the longer term history of processual changes over time as well as the shorter term historical specific context of the 13th to the 11th centuries of special relevance to this discussion are the excavations or surveys conducted during the past 30 years in the central hill country of israel and the transjordan highlands surveys and preliminary attempts to analyze the results within the framework of the broader field of landscape archaeology have transformed our understanding of the textual evidence related to Israel's emergence. This evidence shows that a notable shift in settlement patterns throughout much of Canaan occurred during the course of the late 13th through the 11th century. So you're talking about a 200-year period here, right? Mm -hmm. These far-reaching structural changes correspond to the region-wide fragmentation and dislocation of peoples that characterize the collapse of the late Bronze Age world of empires and international connections in the Eastern Mediterranean. Following centuries of declining sedentary populations, increasing social and economic polarization, and deteriorating conditions in late Bronze Age city-states and in the countryside, dozens of small hamlets and villages appeared over the course of two centuries in the highlands, especially in the hill country between Shechem and Jerusalem. The archaeological records seldom document such large-scale change and regional diversity that is demonstrated during the transition from the Late Bronze to Iron Ages. The resulting settlement and material culture patterns created new cultural and social boundaries that defined Iron Age Canaan. So what she's saying here, what she's getting at, is that within the archaeological record, uh, the picture of Canaan from this period of time of about 1300 to 1100 BCE, you see this shifting demographic where a lot of these small highland villages in the Judean and the Sumerian highlands start popping up, lots of them, over a 200-year period. Uh, many of these have uh, characteristics that the archaeologists and scholars have maybe a little enthusiastically identified as Israelite, things like the four-room house, things like the absence of pig bones, uh, the way that they're terracing uh, their their um, their agricultural, um, the the way that they're terracing their 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 land and their property, and uh, pottery, of course, the 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 presence of 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 a, a, a moderate change in 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 wares indicates this and uh, all we have here is a reflection of an emergence of a new kind of people um but still a people that is very very closely related to whatever occurred before them does that make sense it does it does and with what you were expressing in that clip you're emphasizing that seven to eight locations, according to the Bible, according to Joshua, are utterly destroyed. Yes. And if we want to ask, why is it that scholars don't believe that? It's not, as Michael was implying, because they just don't want to believe it. It's because the evidence clearly doesn't indicate that. On the one hand, you would expect to see so many things if that happened. Things that I'm going to unpack a bit later on, and I'm sure we're going to unpack in general, as well as the stuff that you've just mentioned. Um, but on the other hand, you have all of this contradicting evidence of these people emerging over a period of 200 years exactly and it's between those two elements that this is why scholars do not tend to believe this and why more and more it's it contrary to what michael's saying it's going in the opposite direction or it at least has and maybe now it's going into a state of uh quote-unquote quiescence it's that's that's uh the story i think it could be helpful here just to uh lay out um 
her synthesis here, right, of what's going on in the period. What she likes to talk about, uh, and Killebrew talks about a what she calls a mixed multitude theory in terms of understanding what's taking place in uh, Canaan at the end of the Bronze Age and in the beginning of the Iron Age. So here she says, based on the textual and archaeological evidence outlined above, most approaches to the emergence of Israel fall into one of four general theories, conquest, peaceful infiltration, social revolution, or pastoral Canaanite theories. Schools of thought that not only mirror periods of increased archaeological field work, but also reflect research and political trends over the past 80 years. These theories often reveal not only scholarly opinion and the fashion of the times, but also deeply held personal beliefs. The first two approaches, uh, the conquest and the peaceful infiltration theories, postulate an external origin for the Israelites. However, numerous aspects of Iron One hill country material culture that continue late Bronze Age traditions, such as the ceramic repertoire and elements of cult, tend to cast doubts on a purely external source. More recent schools of thought, recognizing a closer relationship with indigenous traditions, propose an internal or a Canaanite origin. So, and I've got one more section here I'm just going to read. Uh, this is, this is Anne Killebrew's, and, it, and it's, it's a thin synthesis of positions. We, we mentioned briefly, we talked a little bit about Chris Rolston and how he likes this synthesis of a variety of ideas in terms of understanding who the Israelites were and where they came from and, you know, what was taking place at the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. Uh, and, you know, this makes sense because... Uh, social theory is really, really complicated. Understanding what happens with large demographic groups over history is, is you know, affected by many, many different factors. It, it's hard to boil a lot of this stuff down to just one single cause or effect, right? So here she says, ancient Israel's mixed multitude is defined as a collection of loosely organized and largely indigenous, tribal, and kin-based groups whose porous borders permitted penetration by smaller numbers from external groups. Although it is impossible to reconstruct with certainty the proto-history of Israel's origins, it most likely comprised diverse elements of late Bronze Age society, namely the rural Canaanite population, displaced peasants and pastoralists, and lawless Apiru and Shasu, fugitive or runaway Semitic slaves from New Kingdom Egypt may have joined this mixed multitude. Non-indigenous groups mentioned in the biblical narrative, including Midianites, Kenites, and Amalekites, the latter perhaps connected with the control of camel caravan trade routes between Arabia and Canaan, may also have formed an essential element. Egypt's decline an eventual retreat from Canaan undoubtedly was one of the major contributing factors in Canaan's return to a more fragmented, kinship-based tribal society and Israel's subsequent ethnogenesis. So, I say all that uh, just because I think this has to get out onto the table here. Mm. When we talk about things like the the exodus and the conquest. And when Josh and I say things like the exodus and the conquest did not happen, we're not saying that nobody came into the land and that there wasn't conflict and invasion and, and tension uh, from the outside. But what we are saying is that this is not the principal cause of what occurred in the region. Uh, it, was a, it was a combination of all all sorts of things going on up in the north you've got the uh the the destruction the the disappearance of the hittite empire the mitanni empire at the same time also crumbles you've got uh egyptian control and power in the region becoming a, at least greatly reduced over this this larger period of time uh and then 
something else that we it, that it looks like we're seeing in the region is a lot of internal conflict uh cities fighting amongst themselves between each other and then possibly even groups within these cities rising up revolting and overthrowing them all of this is contributing to the mess that is occurring in this 200 year period out of the ashes of which eventually emerge these new people groups and kingdoms israel yes but also moab edom um autumn this is all stuff that's 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 happening uh around the same time so uh sorry to 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 sidetrack that a little bit but i thought that was important to get out there and the point here with regards to what Michael's talking about and my criticism of him is that the picture as it's presented in the book of Joshua is this, that Joshua and the Israelites are going through and just eliminating city after city after city, starting in the south and then going into the north. They are destroying these places. Um, you know, in in uh, in their campaigns against the Canaanites, who are terrified of this incursion that's coming into the land, the evidence that we see on the ground is not this. Yes, there are sites that evidence 13th century destruction from invasions, but that's not all that's there. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot else that's going on. Yep, no, that's uh, that's fair. And what we're going to hear now is how uh, David responded. Well, Michael and David, but particularly um, David now on how he responded to what you're emphasizing. Uh, Dr. Falk, I got a question for you. Sure. How many Egyptian battles were fought in Canaan? Oh, boy. <laughs> Too do many. Have, do we have any evidence <laughs> of the bodies that were be from those Egyptian battles that were 3,000, 3,500 years ago? No, no, oh, we don't have any okay. evidence of the bodies. Mm. <laughs> <It's> just <laughs> so Kip's argument doesn't make sense. So even if his interpretation is right, which I would challenge based on uh, John Walton's research, mm -hmm. uh, even if he was right, uh, who, that doesn't mean they're going to leave behind evidence of corpses no, for no. generations upon generations. I thought this was a, a strange response. Um, to the point that I was making in the video. And I think if I'm understanding them correctly, they're positing that because there's no evidence of, of uh, individual sla or, or slaughter of actual people mm. that I'm interpreting from that, that, uh, um, you know, the, this, this incursion didn't actually happen. And, of course, that's that's silly. Uh, what we should see is considerable evidence, even if if uh, human remains don't don't survive uh, over time. Mm. You should see something. You should see things that indicate a uh, a, a changeover, a cultural shift from one people group to another, and I think that's what. A lot of Anne Killebrew in her assessment said is really important. While there is some gradual shifting in culture, there's also this ongoing continuity, which strongly suggests that these people, these Canaanites, were not slaughtered and driven out. They're still there. Mm -hmm. Something else that I, Michael, Michael sticks on this, uh, on this notion that, uh, um, he, he particularly likes John Walton's definition of this term, harem. Mm -hmm. And I thought I, I, I should probably say something about that. Uh, Walton pro defines this term as to remove something from human use. And this is, you know, echoing uh, Milgram a little bit that I, I met earlier. Uh, so he argues that harem does not on its own mean to utterly destroy. In its most basic sense, it means to prohibit the object of the verb from all human activity. He says that the distinctions made between cities and all who are in them 
as in Joshua 6, 17 and 8, 25, demonstrates that within the campaigns of Joshua, the word was designated for the sites, but not consistently for residents. He goes on to say, note that in Joshua eleven twelve, the royal cities are cherem, but not destroyed. While in Joshua eleven fourteen, the people are shemad, that is completely destroyed, but not cherem. The difference comes from the fact that cherem does not mean destroy, it means remove from use. The city needs to be removed from use, which in turn means that everyone currently using it needs to go away. Uh, so that's from the Lost World of the Israelite Conquest, page 156. So he's curiously ignored, in my opinion, the entire narration of the Southern Campaign in which all the Cherem cities, that's Jericho, Ai, Makedah, Eglon, Lachish, Hebron, and Debir, also include instructions for slaughter of the residents to achieve this end. At Jericho, it says, they made a Cherem offering of everything in the city, from man to woman, boy to old man, including cattle, sheep, and donkeys, with the sword. At Ai, Joshua did not draw back his hand holding his spear until he had made a Cherem offering of all the residents of Ai. Makeda, he made a Cherem offering of them, every living thing that was in it. At Eglon, every living thing that was in it on the day he made a Cherem offering like everything he did to Lachish. At Hebron, he struck it with the sword, its king, its towns, and every living thing that was in it. He did not let any survive, just like everything he did to Eglon. And he made a Cherem offering of it and every living thing in it. Devere, he made a Cherem offering of every living thing that was in it. He did not let anything survive, just like everything he did at Hebron. And then finally at Hatzor, he struck with the sword every living thing that was in it. He made a Cherem offering. Not a single thing, uh, not a single living thing was left. So, yeah, like, this is, I think, abundantly clear. The text wants us to understand that this was an, a total a total annihilation. It was it was comprehensive, um, and in this picture we should expect to see an end of Canaanite residency and culture, and that's just not what we see, mm -hmm. at least not consistently, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's um, man, I had so much. So I have so many things to say to the way that they responded to you here. It's, I don't know where to begin, but <laughs> let's begin with this, right? So it fits their narrative to say that scholars are ignoring evidence with the way that they phrase this. Like you're, you're pointing out that there's a reason why scholars don't believe this, this happened according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're going, oh, what was you expecting to see bodies? As if like, like for a historian, right? Like I'm talking about David here, of course. Like for a historian to think that that's the evidence that you would expect to see, like that's what he expects you to be uh, demanding. Like this is why they can say that there's abundant evidence, but scholars don't believe it. It's because they can say that scholars are basically demanding to see bodies when that's just not how it works. Like even with my rudimentary understanding of history, right, there's like several key evidence types that can be used to uh, look at these kinds of exterminations, especially wide uh, swept exterminations, as described in Joshua. You'd expect to see like spearheads and arrowheads, swords, uh, sedimentary layers. You'll see burned and distributed layers from fires and destruction, fortified walls, battlements, uh, signs of attacks. You might see mass graves, mass burials, um, there would be uh, a sudden uh, absence of domestic artifacts. There'd be new artifacts being moved in if they did move in, which is something that David says that they do and don't do, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, burn marks, collapsed walls, like animal remains. Like there's loads and loads of evidence. Yes. And it isn't, oh, I didn't find bodies <laughs> and therefore that justified not believing it. This is such a colossal straw man that I just... I find it hard to believe that Michael doesn't understand this and that David doesn't understand this. And it makes it actually more likely that they know what they're doing 
which sadly had an effect with their audience. Uh, the audience seemed to think that they, they, this was a this was a worthy response. Th this to me is such a blatant straw man. That is one of the most blatant straw man fallacies I have ever seen, and yet it's coming from Michael, someone that I thought genuinely was was better than this. But my God, like that was that's atrocious by my lights. Yeah, no, I I agree. Um, I, maybe I'll just say one more thing here. Uh, as you were talking, uh, this brought to mind. So one of, uh, like one of the big pieces of evidence that um, proponents of an historical conquest have always pointed to is the city of Khazor. It was destroyed in the 13th century. You know, it matches the time frame for uh, the, 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 late, the, the late exodus uh, theories. It, uh, it, it, it was, you know, destroyed by a large fire. There's evidence of, of, of a, a massive fire. Uh, in the city, and then the city was abandoned. So uh, Yigel Yaden, the uh, archaeologist, one of the archaeologists who uh, who was the director there, said this was the Israelites. This was part of the conquest, you know, coming in and and destroying the city, just like it says in the Book of Joshua, where they destroyed it with fire, um, and nobody lived there after the fact but there is you know there's so much more to it right and within the uh the the archaeological ex excavations taking place at, at Hatsor, there's a lot more going on at the site that uh, often doesn't get reported in these venues you mentioned the presence of of arrowheads as you know an important indicator for conflict or invasion this is something that is not there, there's not a lot of uh, of evidence for this at Hatsor. Something else that we see at Hatsor is that while yes, it was a massive conflagration that destroyed the city, this was limited to you know the palace and the and the temples and kind of the public buildings on the Acropolis and then the residences uh, in the surrounding. Uh, part it's a massive city right uh but the residents is sort of surrounding this uh seem to have been generally untouched something else that you see inside the city of Khatsor is something called uh crisis architecture in about a 100 year period leading up to its destruction in the 13th century crisis architecture is is something that's uh been more recently discussed and uh, presented by archaeologists, this is uh, people uh, taking materials and and doing. You know, it's it's a it's a reduction in quality of material. Uh, there are more temporary structures. The interpretation of this tends to be an indication of some sort of internal social unrest. Uh, so this is the picture that we have. Right? Is this increasing? social unrest inside the city leading up to this massive destruction where the major public buildings and the palace and the temple are utterly obliterated by fire and then uh, an essential abandonment of the entire site. Now, does that sound more like an outside invasion or does that sound more like an internal upheaval? I, I guess what they've, what they're able to do from their position is ignore those kinds of questions by phrasing it as you expecting to see dead bodies all over the place, um, and bodies that you can see three thousand years on, or sorry, longer. Like yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so we're going to continue with their criticism and uh, go from there. Well, I mean, if they're going to take over a town now, some of these uh, uh, towns were not taken over after they were harremed. And they are specifically not taken over because they are harremed. Like Jericho, there's a long fallow period after its late bronze destruction until the Iron Age. Hatsor mm -hmm. is not reoccupied. Um, Horma is not reoccupied. You know, there, there are some eyes not reoccupied. So there are some of these harem towns that once they are haremed and burned, they remain 
unoccupied. And that's just that's just part of the the harem in its most extreme form. Now, harems can vary. Not every harem is is the same. So there's there's degrees of harem. So that's an important point too. Like mm-hmm. for example, um Hebron is placed under the harem, but it's not destroyed. It's occupied. It's occupied. And there are others too that are like this. So it's not it's not a one sort of definition fits all situation. So I I actually think as I've been um as I've been listening to this again that this point about Hebron uh being placed under the harem but not destroyed and occupied actually kind of makes this point that I'm making where I think Walton is wrong, right? Uh I think this works because it's not applied to the city because within the text of Joshua within this time you know where in in this context where we see this word used uh yeah because it applies to the people as i illustrated you know in the descriptions of the destructions of all these places the residents are slaughtered leave nothing left alive everything that had breath was utterly destroyed right i think this works into exactly what i'm saying where it's all about uh offering up the like it's about the booty i think does that make sense josh yeah i see the thing is and by the way if you pronounce it harem again like it's gonna be fisticuffs God, you know what i'm dude. saying like uh, i can't I, I when i listen to him it just it comes out of me i just the next thing that you're gonna say geez. is look when we talk about the eb the abade the abade the, 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 I'm telling you. That's what's going to happen. It's all downhill. The Tukaku <laughs> fallacy. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the smoking gun. There it is. Um, okay. Look, I, like, I agree, I think, with where David is going here in, in general. Yeah. Right? It's true that when you look at the occurrences of harem or its verbal form, whatever. Yeah that you have Sihon and Og, and I think I, I, I talk about this later, like Sihon and Og is a really good example of this, right? They come in, they, they place them under the ban, and then they occupy what, like, there's 60 cities. So, like, it's, it's true that this term has polyvalency. And I went through all the different uses, what, like a month ago now, and... I don't, I don't want to say much to my chagrin because I, I will use it for my Leviticus commentary, but God, it was like going through every example of the verb or the noun of chet rem mesh. Uh, Good God, now I'm getting <laughs> fucked up. Chet <laughs> resh mem. Uh, and, and looking at how it's used. Somebody should clip that and just like yeah. play it on the loop. Oh, it's it's happening. Yeah, <laughs> there's a mesh consonant now. Anyway, <laughs> I I, th- I think they break down into four. Outside of cultic usage, I think they break down into four basic categories. I don't remember them because I've closed that window on my I've, screen. So I've I don't got it here. What they are objects. Dead, uh, there's the negative. So negative is war. Positive is cultic. Uh, negative usages are first objects that are dedicated to Yahweh and destruction. Second is a general destruction or defeat of a city or people. Third is specific and total annihilation. And fourth is the status of someone or something being dedicated to Yahweh for destruction. I think that in so many of these cases, it's the contextual clues that tell us. Yeah. Right? So when you... When you talk about, oh God, what is it? I won't remember now off the top of my head, but is it in, I think it's maybe in Deuteronomy 2, where it talks about uh, that the men, the women, the children, the, uh, yeah, maybe it's the men, women, and children. And then in the next verse, it says, but uh, 
we we all, we didn't place the cattle right the livestock yeah yeah under the ban again i think what david is saying at its core is correct here um well at least what he's trying to get across but I think it's probably slightly more nuanced. I don't yeah. know that it packs the punch that he thinks it does, because I think you're right. There are cases in the prophets, for example, where it's just clear. It's just this general term for to kick a city's ass, right? Just go in and kick a city's ass. Uh, but, but, but there are places where the contextual clues yeah. or the statements surrounding it make it clear that specifically this is what you're doing. Jericho, great example. Yeah. By the way, I is not reoccupied. Don't think that passed us by, right? <laughs> yeah. um, don't think that passed us by. Uh, we're just not going to go there. But no, I'm, I'm half kidding. But you know, the, the 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 point is that I think I think that harem is a very nuanced thing. So I agree with him there. Uh, but I just don't know that, as you said, I don't know that his his argument is uh, effective at this point for what you're talking about. And I think it's, and, and this too, I like, like degrees is probably not the right term to use here because though I, I see, I, I mean, I think what we're seeing, you mentioned it in the prophets, uh, it, it's, it's got a, it, it's got that cultic connotation connotation in the book of Leviticus. You're talking about um, like an etymological shift in terms of the usage of the word and the way in which we're 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 dating and looking at, at some of these texts in particular, like the book of Joshua, uh where within this context it seems to have taken on these specifications, right? Uh you kill all the residents of the city, leave nothing left alive, uh everything that breathes you wipe it out. That is the repeated refrain throughout uh, chapter 10, the Southern Campaign, and that's exactly how, how it, uh, it it describes the destruction of uh, Chatzor as well, right? Mm -hmm. I suspect, I was trying to think of an English example here, annihilate is probably a pretty good one because annihilate or decimate maybe is another one that would be that would be good because there are contexts where decimate means very specifically like to reduce by 10, ten right? or right. A, a tenth yes. i guess is what it would be um but annihilate i feel like is probably more appropriate because annihilate in in some contexts means utterly wipe them like like uh, uh, annihilate mm -hmm. that uh virus from the body or something i don't know but you know, something where it's like it it completely gets rid of it Right. But it's also used in contexts, as we hear so often, like football games, right? We annihilated the other team. Mm. So it has, it, it, it conjures up just like so many other words, uh, like an, a general idea. But in certain cases, it becomes quite specific in its meaning. And I think that's probably what's going on here. The interesting thing about it is I think it did have this original etymological context yeah. or this original context of cultic removal. And some of that gets retained yeah. in certain contexts and its usage. And and yet it takes on a more general sense as well. And so we just have to rely on on the context. And again, I think David would agree with us here from what he said. But I think that I mean, that yeah, sorry, go ahead, Stephen. I was just gonna say that I mean, in any case, right, if we if we take Harem, don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, please don't hurt me. <laughs> and we take the way that he's talking about it. He's been listening to too much David Falk too. Indeed. Uh if you take Harem and you look at um, the way that David's speaking about it, he's saying that some places um, were left desolate permanently. Some were um, for extended periods. Others were eventually resettled. Some were, you know, taken over quite quickly. Like there's these degrees, as he puts it. The main point here is that if there were some of them that were completely wiped out, you'd expect to see archaeological evidence for this. Yeah. Uh, you'd expect to see archaeological evidence across the board. And that doesn't mean, Michael, bodies. Okay, it doesn't mean bodies. It means archaeological evidence. It means the you know the arrowheads. It means the uh, just the the whole the whole list that we went through earlier. And I think that's really the crux that can be lost on this. It's like yeah. D David saying this as if it somehow refutes uh, what you were what you were expressing, and it just it just doesn't clear demographic cultural shifts that we just we just don't see. Yeah, you you're you're. You're picking that up. That's 
that's right. So, um, so uh, I think this, uh, the, 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 I like to often say, uh, when talking about this word that we really need to carefully consider it's, uh, what I would, I would consider, I, I think it's probably right that, that in its original usage, it carried with it this, this heavy cultic connotation more particularly what we see in in like the book of leviticus but i think even as the word develops in its usage uh within these 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 military contexts this the cultic nature of it is still really really important to bear in mind this is a sacred act it's a devotion right and that's why it's so serious because within an ancient near eastern economy of of sacrifice uh, the way I like to say this is that um, in really, really primitive early religions, um, sacrifice was the means of getting stuff from the natural realm into the realm of the gods. They had to be destroyed. Uh, if you wanted to something to pass over to the god for their use or their benefit, it had to be destroyed. That's just that's just how things were done. Um, if you think about what's going on with that sort of view in mind, this kind of makes sense. Uh, uh, elements that are committed to the ban, the cherem, that become cherem offerings are property of Yahweh. And you destroy them in order to get them into his possession, right? Uh, I just thought I'd I'd look at a couple of uh, uh, definitions here of of the word. So this first one is from the New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and uh, exe exegesis. This is actually a, a pretty conservative publication. It's by Zondervan, um, and it says the verb is only used in the causative stems hifil and hofal. To it, it designates a special act of consecration. It involves consecration of something or someone as a permanent and definitive offering for the sanctuary or in war. The consecration of a city denotes also the total annihilation of a population. Total annihilation of a population. Uh, the, the standard work, the much larger, uh, theological dictionary of the Old Testament says this, the hifil of Cherem belongs to the fixed framework of a generally constant narrative schema found in Deuteronomistic texts. It appears regularly in wars of conquest against enemy cities. The negative is implied when anyone survives, is delivered, is released, is shown mercy is saved alive, or even is allowed to make a treaty or enter into marriage. The taking of booty can also imply the negative. And that's something that comes out crystal clear in the stories surrounding Cherem in the Bible and in the, uh, in the descriptions of Cherem as it's applied to the Canaanite cities is this. It is... It is such a form of extreme devotion that it can't be broken. Hmm. I often say with this, when, when it comes to the usage of this term, there's no half measures. It's all or nothing when it comes to when it comes to uh, uh, warfare, to the ban. Um, generally speaking, the point of ancient warfare was the accumulation of spoils. It's about enriching it's it's about the king enriching himself and it's about you know the army enriching themselves people are convinced to go to war because they think they can get stuff out of it right now when a harem is pronounced this is an extreme expression of devotion by which everyone foregoes their part of a plunder all the plunder everything is rendered unto the God. And the stories of the Cherem, you know, Achan, uh, Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15, emphasize this point. Holding back is the problem. Holding back is utterly verboten. And I think this is the part that 
pretty strongly mitigates a, against this idea that there were there were built-in degrees, right? I think that's that's probably the wrong way of expressing this. Uh, insofar as the text is concerned, it's it's kind of an all or nothing thing. You commit everything to Yahweh and you follow through with it. If I'm not mistaken, um, so in Joshua, it is made really clear uh, in some co in some situations, in some examples, that that is exactly what is demanded. It is utter destruction. It is destroy the women, the children, the animals, all of it. Burn it to a ground, annihilate it. Leave nothing left alive. Exactly. And so if you find, which you can find, um, contradictions of this within the Bible itself, it leaves you in a position of, well, okay, I need to make sense of this data. You can't just assume that the rest of them didn't also have this annihilation applied. You have to do some work here. You have to show that that's not the case. And it seems to me, and uh, you tell me what you think of it, it seems to me that David's just not doing that work at all. He's just speaking as if like, hey, we've got some examples here so we can, we can, we can ex extrapolate from that to the others. I guess I'd have to think about it. Mm hmm and I'd have to think about here. This is just me musing, so you know nobody nobody should uh, leave this stream and go quote me on this. Uh, but I wonder, just thinking through the examples that we've been talking about, I wonder if one of the things that you see at least see somewhat consistently in these passages is there's an assumption if it's being used in that more specific sense, not in the general, which you see maybe in the prophets sort of sense, that these caveats, these descriptors that are put in here, like men, women, children, uh, but the cattle we, we spared, like those things, I wonder if these are frequently spelled out because the back assumption or the assumption uh, of the audience is that, well, this, if this thing is under the ban, that means that all of these things are going to be wiped out. Yeah, right. All of these things are going to be dedicated. So I, I wonder if that's the case. And of course, like the flagship example is Jericho, right? Yeah. Which is why it's, or, you know, and, and uh, that and uh, First Samuel, excuse me, First Samuel 15 with uh, Saul and the Amalekites. But I just wonder if maybe these caveats are put in or these additional comments are put in we can stop talking about this sorry uh, but you know, maybe they're put in because the audience has this general assumption this is a ban it's going to include everything and so we have to specify at times when it doesn't mm. yeah all right let's proceed with more of the response moreover even if you have that where you know you have this this sort of um slaughter of the entire population you're not going to leave the bodies just lying around. There's good reasons not to leave the bodies what <laughs> lying around. I like, for example, quick, wild animals. Yeah, real quick to just interject. It's just like, does he think that like they? That's what they did. Like they went to these cities, and they killed everyone, and then they just left the bodies there. Like left the bodies, bodies in the. Hey, 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 little uh, uh, Mishka! Don't touch the rotting Canaanite in the middle of the living room. <laughs> No, Michael. I think the only people that interpreted Kip is saying that are you guys. Honestly. Like, what's that? Right? What the hell did I say? <laughs> yeah. So, you know me. I'm Mr. <laughs> I'm Mr. <laughs> Give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they, maybe I missed, maybe I missed something. But this one, mm. like, I, I'm honestly confused by this response. So here's, here's Kip's full quote. Well, this depends very much on how Michael, and by extension, Kenneth Kitchen, are defining widespread mass destruction. Because as I read the text, this is just wrong. Yes, Jericho, I, and Hatsor are the only cities mentioned in the text specifically as having been burned. But there were actually either seven or eight cities in which the Israelites were commanded to destroy everything. That is, they were to kill everything and everyone alive, indiscriminate killing, and render everything else of value either useless or unto Yahweh's uh, sanctuary. This is what a harem offering is. In addition to Jericho, Ayin, Hatzor, this was commanded for Makedah, Eglon, Hebron, Debir, and possibly also Lachish. 
I think the focus on burning is a distraction, end quote. So what seems odd to me is the focus on dead bodies or corpses that we should find in the archaeological record. Where is Kip making that assertion in this quote? If we're asking the question, what should we expect to find in the archaeological record if there was an invasion by the Israelites into Canaan, then I think Kip's point was the same as the other archaeologists who have asked that same question in the past. Evidence of destruction. Yeah. Why would this have to come in the form of evidence of corpses? Now, to be clear, we do sometimes give evidence of warfare and destruction in the form of dead bodies. For example, as Jeffrey Zorn, in his article, War and Its Effects on Civilians in Ancient Israel and Its Neighbors, discussed the archaeology of the city of Lachish and its attack in 701 BCE by the Assyrians. He writes, The town's population was likely swelled by refugees seeking protection inside its fortifications during the Assyrian invasion, and perhaps also by additional soldiers sent to defend it. Still, the sheer number of victims points to a horrendous loss of life, end quote. What was this sheer number of victims to which Sorn refers? There were four Bronze Age tombs that were repurposed during this period for mass burial. Quote, these tombs had to be reused by the end of the 8th century B.C. for the mass burial of as many as 1,500 individuals who were dumped through the collapsed roofs uh, of the tomb group which most, uh, with most of the bodies coming from Tomb 120. It's probably worth pointing out here that um, there are two complete adult female skeletons and, and four children that were found in the ruins of uh, uh, Lachish 4. I think it's Lachish 4? No, Lachish 6. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and that dates, that dates to 1130 BCE, which is, by the way, about 100 years uh, late. Mm. But... Uh, yeah, so uh, sure, sometimes we find dead bodies, and sometimes we find dead bodies of women and children in these sites. Yeah. And I think, like, more generally, Zorn writes this, uh, archaeological excavations often turn up destruction layers in towns probably destroyed by war, but usually few bodies are recovered, probably for several reasons. And I think they, they mentioned at least one of these. Uh, first, survivors likely attempted to recover the bodies and bury them properly. Also, some remains were likely scavenged by animals, leaving only scattered parts. Second, many people may have fled their homes if they knew an attack on their town was imminent. Usually, complete human bodies in archaeological destruction deposits are found singly. He cites a, a few examples here. A few sites contain significant destruction deposits with human skeletal remains that may be associated with warfare, end quote. But the salient point here is, is this. Why this odd focus on dead bodies turning up in the archaeological record? Kip was addressing the fact that when we examine the late Bronze Age strata, we find inconsistencies with the biblical descriptions of uh, descriptions of occupation, battle, burning, killing, reoccupation, etc. None of this necessitates that there be, quote, rotting Canaanite bodies being left in the middle of the living room for little children to stay away from. Yeah, I, I found this to be one of the most disingenuous or outright pathetic responses I've ever seen in all of apologetics. Like this really takes the piss to to so fundamentally straw man the view that you were putting across the criticism that you were putting across and it mesmerizes me personally that any audience can take that seriously like it's such it's such a pathetic view to put in your uh to, to ascribe to you kip that it just it troubles me that people don't think no surely he didn't say that sure, surely surely this isn't what he would expect to see. Surely this isn't what's going on. Um, yeah, it's uh, real bizarre. Look, I'm open to there being some piece of information that they were thinking about that maybe they thought Kip implied or something. I, it would be useful to know what that is. I agree. But I mean, as it stands, like, I, I just don't know what that is. I, and no, like, uh, Kip, let me ask you. Let's just get it out there. <laughs> Do you think 
Do you think that if the archaeological record does not turn up dead bodies, that means that there was no destruction of the city? No. Did I ask that right? <laughs> yeah, I think I think so. And the answer is no. Yeah, well, you know, like we don't have any dead bodies of, uh, you know, like uh, the Carthaginians. Um, take it you don't believe in that either right is that can we just apply this to everything can we just start saying kip, kip denies all history unless you can find bodies <laughs> this is a total tangent but but i i've decided i would i would like to donate my remains to to science in some capacity um just trying to decide what what form that'll take but i i did notice there's a there's an interesting uh, project, I think it's in Arizona. They'll 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 pick up your body and they'll they'll take it out into the into the desert in Arizona. And it'll leave it there cool. uh, for the animals uh, to scavenge, and they they run tests on on uh, you know what's happening with uh, with animals in in the desert and dead bodies. I, I don't know. I thought that might be interesting. Well, as long as the animals don't completely eat every part of you, and we've got some part of your corpse left, then we do actually have proof that you existed. Outside of that, nothing, zero game over <laughs> there's no evidence whatsoever that's how that works none <laughs> all right let's continue let's continue with the critique you know he, he talks about this happening to seven or eight cities well considering how many towns there are in canaan that's the exception that's not the mm. rule and besides the whole point of the conquest is to move in it's, it's not to burn everything and destroy everything. It's to move into people's cities, move into their homes, eat from their vineyards, eat off their dishes. So you're going to clean up the place after. And stop the child sacrifice, according to yeah, chop the Yeah, chop, yeah. stop the child sacrifice. I, I think, again, this might be missing the point of what you were saying. And listen, so that everybody knows this, we're not the first persons, we're not the first persons, <laughs> we're not the first people to say this, to make this argument. Like Eric Klein uh, wrote, what was it, from, from Eden to Exile, I think it was the title of the book. And his chapter on, on the conquest, this was like the methodology, this is what he was testing. And I mean, obviously Eric Klein is a fucking brilliant archeologist, right? So um, it, like this is, this. there's nothing novel about what Kip is saying here. This is what scholars are talking about when they talk about the conquest and they talk about these sites. Is they're saying, look, the, the, the destruction layers that we expect to see are not there or they're there at the wrong time. There's, 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 I just don't understand this big pushback here. If you want to make the argument that like they do in some places, right? Like Jericho has, you know, parts, the late bronze age, you know, are, are, are cut away or eroded or whatever. Yeah. Fine. Fine. That like, but that's, that's engaging with the argument with what Kip is saying. Look, we expect to see a destruction layer. You're saying, yeah, we do, but it's cut away. So now we can't expect to see that. But that's you agreeing with him. So I, that, that, that's, that, that's a sound methodology. And so, again, it, I'll shut up. But if the, if the argument that David is putting forward here is that harem doesn't necessarily mean that the city has to be destroyed, fine. But Kip isn't making the argument that every city was in, destroyed yeah. of all the cities in canaan he's saying that these this set like eric klein was saying like this set i think he had five or six or maybe eight i can't remember how many he looked at uh we would expect to see given the narrative we would expect to see a destruction layer something. here or evidence of cultural change or something yeah something that don't. corresponds mm. right uh and whatever that looks like you know, it certainly doesn't have to be dead bodies. There's other there's other things that we would expect to see, right? Um, I just I, I, I sorry I just I just uh, I I wanted to to plug to point out that um, last week I I did an interview um, 
with uh, our our friend Dan McClellan, we we interviewed uh, uh, Professor Heath Durrell, who is nice. the author of the very fine book "Child Sacrifice in Ancient Israel." Um, so that I'll that link was it fun. below. So a few things that came to my mind here, and this is tangential, I guess, but like it was David's use of the term uh, of, of the term towns instead of cities which alters the scale and the significance of the conquest. This is something that he and Michael do throughout. They start, they start talking about, you know, being put into servitude. Well, what does that mean? It means put into fucking slavery. But, like, the, the language is all uh, this more softer, wishy-washy. He even uses a term later on, we get to it, but he uses a term that implies that they were put into temporary servitude, when that's just not the case. So one thing that, that, that just kept rubbing me up the wrong way is that that is what he's doing throughout all of his responses on this point it's probably like towns the the word ear in hebrew that's translated as city it can mean mm -hmm. uh it, it it's not size specific so and lots of and lots of these sites are pretty small too so it's and i but i think i think on the other side of this right Within the narrative of the book of Joshua, I think the sense that the author is trying to convey is that this is this is a massive route, right? Um, so absolutely, there's some exaggeration in terms of exactly, I think, how, how large and how powerful a lot of these places are envisioned to be. If they were moving in, as David's saying, um, and they were displacing enemies of God or you know, like just taking over the culture, we would expect to see those cultural shifts, like like economic changes and evidence of uh, certain resources being moved and, and changed, like as we have seen with with this happening with other settlements, and yet that's absent. And that's like one piece of evidence that's suggesting that this didn't happen. Actually, just quick, the mentioning of like the child sacrifice, right? Yeah. So on the child sacrifice, they're saying this was the purpose. Right. Do we have any extra biblical evidence of this whatsoever? Or is this entirely just from the Bible going, listen, we need to find a way to justify killing, you know, in many cases, all of the women and the children and the men. So how can we justify, okay, child sacrifice, that's how we're going to do it. Like, is there any extra biblical evidence of this at all? This is, this is super complex. And I, and since I just, I just talked to, uh, to Heath Durrell about this, right? Um, so evidence for child sacrifice anywhere is not easy to come by just by nature of the fact that like, certainly when it comes to, when it comes to infants too, uh, because their, their, their bodies are mostly cartilage at, at the, at, you know, when they're, when they're really little, uh, they, the, the remains, uh, just don't survive for very long. So, but there are some there's there's epigraphic evidence of uh child sacrifice being a thing particularly among the um uh the punic uh people who were who were getting a, like all around uh the mediterranean and then yeah within the bible you have this is this is kind of a kind of a feature mm -hmm. uh abraham you know, and the attempted offering of, of Isaac, his son, you've got Jephthah, uh, the sacrifice of his daughter, you've got uh, uh, two kings in in history, in, in uh, Ju Judah history, offering their sons as child sacrifices. The king Misha of Moab offers his son as a, as a, a, a burnt offering in order to turn the tide against the Israelite, and it works. So... And then you've got this this strong polemic um, against it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, and I don't know if this is this is what what most scholars do, but but I think definitely uh, s there's a strong scholarly opinion that child sacrifice was actually practiced by worshippers of Yahweh, you know, mm -hmm. at various points in their history. And that at later points in their history, this became um, something that was heavily censured and then used as a means to even just further denigrate, you know, uh, earlier generations of people or people that they didn't like. 
So um, it's a, but it is, it's a super comp complex issue. It's a complicated issue, but most often what you see in the biblical text is places where, you know, we've got to, we've got to kill them because of all the child sacrifice. It's almost more like a, uh, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a form of ancient projection <laughs> where, you know, this is, we recognize this now as really bad. Mm -hmm. So we're going to wipe, you know, we're, we're, we're totally against this, um, even though it's it's something that uh, that that um, is is something that that we used to do. I think Jeremiah is a great example of this in Jeremiah chapter seven. Um, there's a there's an oracle from Yahweh where he goes, uh, you know, I'm I'm going to destroy Jerusalem because they've been they've been offering their sons as sacrifices on the Tophet. And then he goes, this is something I never wanted. I didn't command this. This never came to my mind, right? It's 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 uh, what's the expression from Shakespeare? Thou thou dost protest too the much. The lady doth protest too much. That's it. Thank you, Josh. I always get that one wrong. You know, that's uh, something you see with a lot of uh, cultures, especially when they're trying to give themselves a narrative and a story. Uh, you've got to clean that up. Yeah. So it can't just be that we took this or did that. You need to go, no, no, no. They were really bad people. They needed this happening. It was the only solution. But I don't know. The irony for me is like, listen, that group over there, they're sacrificing their children. And we've got to teach them a lesson by going over there and wiping out all of their children. Like, brilliant. Right. Well done. Yeah. Well played. <laughs> but, and let's be clear here, right? Because, uh, when, because it seems as though most of the Israelites emerged out of Canaan, like they were, they were Canaanites, right? So this is, you know, this is them basically trying to draw this artificial distinction between us and them. Oh, but they're, they're actually us. Well, the fact is, too, that most of the harem, like uh, almost every instance of the harem is not directed against an indigenous person. There's only one instance that I was able to find that connected harem to Canaanites. And that was with Arad. And that's because Arad attacks Israel while they're wandering in, in the Sinai. Okay. But with the exception of, of Arad, everything else was directed either against the um, Amorites or the Amalekites. Both of these are not native peoples to Israel. Amorites, they're from northern Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. Amalekites, they're one of the sea peoples. They're the Amaluka. So these are different, these are, these are non-indigenous people that have come in, conquered the land, did the atrocities that come with conquering the land. And, you know, this is a common pattern, especially amongst the Amorites. You know, Amorites did this all the time. You know, when they went to, to Egypt and they set up their kingdom there, the uh, 15th dynasty, the Hyksos kingdom, what they do? They start desecrating graves, doing atrocities against Egyptians. You know, tax them harshly. So, they had a reputation for doing this from place to place. Mm. Wow. There is a lot to unpack <laughs> there. Uh, who wants that at first? Uh, I think you should go first, Josh. <laughs> no, no. Go, go, go ahead. I, I think you... Uh... Oh, so, I mean, he's... So, this is... Oh... So this is this is folk like trying to trying to to read the uncritically in my opinion uh the biblical story of the conquest and the people who are are living there back onto the actual historical record and 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 the the geography of the region so and we talked a little bit about this I think in the last in the last the last time we were we were reviewing this video he's got this idea right that the Amorites are not indigenous to the southern Levant insisting that the Amudu 
from Syria mentioned in the Amarna letters are the actual Amorite kings described by Joshua. At least I think that's that's what he's what he's doing. That the people whom the book of Joshua identifies as the Amorites must be the same people that come from Syria, from this uh, this kingdom of Amudu centered on on uh, Ugarit. Uh, and somehow, you know, this, this, this situates them further south in, uh, in the land of Canaan. So he, he's got this model whereby this group, the Amorites entered and displaced the indigenous Canaanite population from the north sometime in the 14th century, I would expect. But when it comes to the like the biblical text uh some some commentators have have observed that like particularly within the in the book of Joshua the, the distinguishing feature between like Canaanite settlements and Amorite settlements uh seem to be that the Canaanites are on the plains in the lower lowlands in the in the lower regions and the Amorites um, describe those who are in the highlands. And of course, this is flatly historically inaccurate, right? Mm -hmm. It's just the problem here is the text. The text does not have a clear picture of who was living in Canaan at the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. I'll just read a quote here from uh, Amahai Mazar. Uh, Numbers 21, 21 to 32 tells of the wars of the Israelites against Sihon, king of the Amorites, and he's got Amorites in scare quotes here, and of the conquest of Heshbon. Heshbon, Tel Heshbon, was settled for the first time in the Iron Age 1, but very sparsely. According to the remains, there is no archaeological testimony of an, again, in scare quotes, Amorite state in this region, which could have been conquered by the Israelites, nor is there any evidence of a Moabite kingdom in the Iron Age 1, in spite of the discovery of, uh, in the region of several sites from this period. Um, he goes on to say the tradition about Balaam, the seer, heroes of Numbers 22 to 24, is now attested archaeologically by the plaster inscriptions found at Tel Deir Allah, near the mouth of the uh, Jabbok, but these inscriptions date to Iron Age II, that's 8th to 7th century BCE, and do not confirm the historicity of the tradition in the decisive period in question. And if I, like, I, I should probably uh, talk about his comment about the Amalekites. So Falk stated quite matter-of-factly, and he's... Uh, done so, I think, more recently in some more detail, that the Amalekites are actually the group known as the Luca, uh, from the group that you know we, we call the Sea Peoples, from whom we know the Philistines, who are the Peleset, uh, came at the end of the Late Bronze Age, most famously. In a video that he produced uh, after the release of the video that we're reviewing, Falk argued that the etymology of Amalekite derives from the words for people, and Luca or Luki. In a recent rather lengthy contribution, Richard Steiner explains some of the positions that scholars have taken on the Amalekites, ultimately putting forward his own theory on the etymology of the name. About the Amalekites as they appear in the Bible, he writes, quote, the Pentateuch portrays the Amalekites as a clan of Edomites descended from a concubine, Genesis 36. As such, they would, perhaps, have had no right to inheritance, Genesis 21 and 25, and hence, no reason to stay near the Transjordanian heartland of Edom. The Bible twice locates them at Shur, near Egypt, 1 Samuel 15 and 27, just across the border from Pithom, once at Rephidim in the Sinai Peninsula in Exodus 17, and at least twice near Kadesh Barnea, Genesis 14 and Numbers 14, to mention only the places closest to Egypt, end quote. He sums it up. In short, the area where the Amalekite tribes roamed in the Negev and Sinai deserts uh, was the Cisjordanian hinterland 
of what we may call Greater Edom. Concerning the etymology of the name, he writes, Almost all modern scholars have pleaded ignorance concerning the origin of the name Amalek. There is, however, a clue. The presence of the sound, as the ion sound, uh, in a biblical place name would normally point to a Semitic origin. But Amalek looks non-Semitic because of its length. The only non-Semitic language that has the voiced pharyngeal phoneme, uh, or phone, uh, the ion, in the Sinai is Egyptian. I suggest that Amalek, or its adjectival form, uh, Amalekite, is derived from an Egyptian uh, phrase, I don't know Egyptian, uh, meaning hostile Asiatic. This etymology dovetails nicely with the assertion in the Anchor Bible Dictionary that, quote, every encounter between Amalek and Israel in the Old Testament is marked by hostility, end quote. So, Steiner does not seem to think that there is an obvious or agreed-upon etymology of the name Amalekite, and he does not even mention the idea that it could or should be understood as Falk understands it, the people of Luki. In fact, as far as I can tell, scholars do not argue for this connection at all. It appears that the Luki originated in Anatolia, and there is no suggestion in the literature that they have any connection to the Amalekites that come from the south around Edom. For example, Klein and O'Connor wrote, quote, The Luki, as well known from numerous additional inscriptions, Hittite as well as Egyptian, uh, possibly because they were notorious pirates. Most scholars see the Luki as originating in Anatolia, Although there is some discussion as to where exactly in Anatolia they came from, most agree that it was probably southwestern Anatolia in the area later known as Lycia and Caria. They are believed to have raided Cyprus upon occasion, as recorded in the Amarna letters of the mid-14th century BC, and to have fought on the side of the Hittites against the Egyptians at the Battle of Kadesh, circa 1286. Very unfortunately, evidence for the Luki in Anatolia is purely textual. No cultural remains have yet been definitively identified as being able to identify such a Luki group. And that's in the Mystery of the Sea Peoples in Mysterious Lands, 2003. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot more um, that scholars have said about this too, right? Like uh, Bach Huber agrees it is now generally acknowledged that the Luca lands recorded in the Hittite texts are to be placed in Lycia in southwestern Anatolia. Halpern, in the 2013 SBL volume on the Sea Peoples, writes, The concentration of all these peoples is in or very near Asia Minor. The Luca, the Lycians, appear at Kadesh as Hittite vassals from Anatolia's southwestern coast. See the superb study by Poeto, 1993, 75-84. Eric Klein, in his 2021 book, 1177, writes, Scholars generally accept Luca as a reference to peoples from southwestern Turkey in the regions later known during the classical area as Lycia. They are also known from earlier inscriptions, those of Ramses II, concerned with the Battle of Kadesh in 1274 BC, as well as from a variety of Hittite inscriptions. Again, this does not mean that they could not be the Amalekites, but we have not seen anyone in the field make a case for this connection. Nothing as of yet. Uh, and as for the Amalekites themselves, in terms of like this is definitely when you're when you're reading Hebrew, this is definitely not how people of the Luca would sound. Uh, the vocalization of the Hebrew word Amaleki does not provide for that translations. Uh, you know, it. It. Uh, I. I think. Um. There. Josh mentioned above that. Uh, there's ongoing dispute and discussion about the etymology of Amalek, and uh, and this term Amaleki, and I very much doubt that Folk is the one to have solved this mystery, right? Yeah. 
I, I quite like, Josh mentioned this article by Steiner. It's really interesting, uh, not just in terms of, of uh, wh- uh, how he he understands the uh, the Amalekites, but there's there's a lot of other really interesting uh, stuff in, in that article. I And I think he makes a good case that was derived from, I, I believe it's pronounced the Egyptian, uh, and it's a pejorative, right? Amraki, I think is actually how it's how it's pronounced. Hostile Asiatic. So what we're seeing here then is that like folks confident statements on the Amalekites, as is the case with so many of his confident statements, which are said in such a way that to a layperson or someone that doesn't have the expertise, someone like myself, it just comes across as that's definitely the case. Like scholars obviously agree with him on that. It's 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 said with such confidence and so straight. Um what we've just seen is that's not the case. And actually he hasn't done his work. It's possible that he's correct in what he's saying, but he to say it in the way that he has and as confidently he as he has is not something you typically see with scholarship, but it is something you typically see with apologetics. And this is I, I think this is the big point here, right? Like two two things. One, um, you know, if if Kip and I are being straight here, which I mean I hope I hope that we always are. Like, even though we think Steiner's made a good case, yeah. like, it, like who gives a fuck what we think, <laughs> right? We're not, like, we're not goddamn, uh, you know, we don't specialize in etymology. We're not Egyptian specialists. So, I mean, like, cool. I mean, it sounds really, it sounds really good. But, I mean, like, but the, this is the main point, right? Is that if, if Falk, Like if Falk is going to make this assertion and then make a video sort of like doubling down on it. And I think at the end of that video, what did he say? Was it like, it was something like, uh, get over it. The peoples moved all over the place, including into the Negev. Deal with it. It was something to that effect. Deal with it. Yeah. (laughs) You know, awesome. Right? Like if he has, because, because here's the thing, Stephen, maybe he has done that work. Right. Maybe he does have me show it, please. Yeah. Well, this is the and thing. Publisher, right? right. So like my, my note here says this. I think that Falk should probably make a positive argument for why we should <laughs> conclude that the Luca were the Amalekites. The only thing I have heard him do at this point is make that assertion. And in that video to say, essentially, well, it's possible that they could be the same group. So, yeah, sure, they come from Anatolia, but, I mean, like, the Pleset come from us. So, like, they're, you know, the, the, the Denian, like, uh, they move around a lot. Like, well, th- that's not a positive case for why they should be equated with the Amalekites. That's just saying it's not impossible, Yeah. right? And that, I think that's the big thing here. If he's done this work, and let's, maybe we just assume that he has, mm-hmm. and and then say, great, could you please lay it out for us? That's what that's that's all I'm saying. Now, I actually had uh, quite a different take to both of you on on this, uh, probably because I I bought into his confidence on this statement, right? I, oh, it's because you didn't read Steiner. I didn't read <laughs> Steiner exactly. So, <laughs> but here's here's what I was here's what what I got from it, and I I find this so so bad, right? So, like David's entire point here is that. Uh, because the Canaanites were not indigenous, this somehow justifies what happens in with the command, right? And I think to myself, people don't believe this. Like, for instance, under under that rubric, does he think, for instance, that Jews today shouldn't be in Israel, that they should be removed because they're not indigenous? Like, I know he may have a different angle on this, but you could apply this to, say, America. Like, do you go in there and do you remove all of the Caucasians? Do you just go, nope, you're not allowed there? you know, sorry, there hasn't been a sufficient number of generations, or do you just draw some arbitrary line where you go, right, that's enough generations, you're actually now considered indigenous, and so therefore we're not justified. Talk, talk about desecration and, and atrocities committed, right? Yeah. Uh, the Americans are, a, or, or the Americans, uh, <laughs> the 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 settlers, the English settlers are, are you know, a, a, a capital example of uh invaders doing just that so i mean yeah and and like because this is all in the context of justification like that just doesn't work at all like at least with some of these situations you have the entire wiping out of children and women and men and young boys Mm -hmm. and like 
even in the best case scenario, you have like uh, put into servitude, so slavery. Like you've got like this utter decimation, this utter annihilation, and it's justified on what? Like they're not indigenous. They, uh, it's just to get good people to speak this way. It it takes religion, in my opinion. Like it takes ideology, at least. This is it. It's so messed up. And again, this is all in the context of somehow you mentioning apparently that there should be bodies. <laughs> The dialectic is such a mess. I'm I'm glad you brought that up though, because it is like it is a little confusing what the point is he's he is trying to make with this. Cause it almost sounds like it comes out as uh well this this wasn't really, you know, Israel came coming in and taking land that belonged to someone else because they had already stolen it from those poor Canaanites. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of that's that's part of what I'm hearing, and maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, it's justification. It's but yeah, it's it's this uh, it's this justification. But honestly, like that just does not align with what the Bible says. Yeah, I mean, like one, it doesn't align with the Bible. Two, it's just a gross justification that he wouldn't apply consistently. And if he does, he'd have to do it with a very arbitrary measure, like in generations. Like, I, I, how how do you do this? It's, it's lunacy. Um, and then the most important thing in terms of the, the the conversation is like we have to like go back to what's being said here, right? You're saying, look, here's some of the reasons we don't believe that the conquest happened according to the Bible, and then they've responded by going, "What? You think that there's going to be bodies on in in the room? <laughs> well, get this." Turns out that the Amalekites actually come from this place and that place. What, what are you on about? Like, how does this, like, <laughs> how does this address any of this? Like, this is just cascading. <laughs> and Deaver actually discusses this very point. He says, biblical apologists, I'm not kidding, that's what he says. Biblical apologists, for <laughs> example, some evangelical scholars, tend to ignore the archaeological data because it is challenging. For them, if one must choose one's facts, the biblical facts trump all others. In some cases, conservative scholars argue that the Bible never claims that the Israelites destroyed all the sites listed in Joshua 12. Only three are said to have been destroyed by fire, Jericho, Ein Hatzor. That is true. But how do these scholars suppose the Israelites took all the other no. cities listed as conquered? <laughs> the Hebrew verb in Joshua 12, 7 is Naha, to smite. Is it feasible to think that a large force of Israelite warriors surrounded a given city, that the terrified inhabitants then simply surrendered or conveniently disappeared, and thus the city came into Israelite hands peacefully, as it were? The argument that the biblical writers really did not mean to say that these sites were destroyed is disingenuous, end quote. Anything you want to add to that before we hear their response? I, I just think Deaver's a boss, but that's... Yeah, he really is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's hear it. We do have actually records of several Canaanite cities surrendering. Mm hmm Like Gezer. Gezer surrenders. You know, Gezer surrenders. The people are put into corvée labor, and, you know, they take the city. That's very typical. We see this consistently if you go look through the, the Bible on Canaanites. You see this over and over again. They surrendered. And then they were basically made servants for the Israelites. So that's very, very typical amongst Canaanite cities. They are not harammed, generally. They're basically facing an overwhelming opposition. The, the Amorites couldn't stand up to them. So what chance did the Canaanites have? So... <laughs> Gezer is mentioned several times in the biblical traditions. In Joshua 10.33, the king of Gezer, uh, Horam, comes to the aid of the army of Lachish, only to suffer defeat at the hands of Joshua, Joshua 12.12. 12. Uh, we see in Joshua 16.10 that the text notes that Gezer continued to have Canaanites living in it, and these remained until that day. You see also Judges 1.29. David did battle with the Philistines from Geba to Gezer in 2 Samuel 5.25 and 1 Kings 9.16-17 tells us that the Canaanites that remained in the land until the time of Solomon had been defeated by the Egyptian Pharaoh who defeated Gezer and burned it, giving it to his daughter as a wedding gift when she married Solomon 
who then rebuilt the city. From an archaeological and historical perspective, Stephen Ortiz, in his entry in the Oxford Encyclopedia on the Bible and Archaeology, notes that it was destroyed in 1468 BCE by Thutmose III and was then partially abandoned during the 15th century. There was a late Bronze Age pillared city that was quote-unquote violently destroyed by Merneptah. Uh, Ortiz states that during Iron I, the population was likely a combination of Philistines and Canaanites, followed by a 10th century destruction by Siamun of the 21st Egyptian dynasty. So all of that to say this. It seems to me that Falk is saying that in passages like Joshua 16.10, where it says that the Israelites did not dispossess X people from the land, that this means that they surrendered to them. The problem with this interpretation, as I see it, is that passages like Joshua 17, 12 to 13 indicate that it was only when Israel later became strong that they were able to subject the Canaanites to forced labor. We see this also in Judges 1, 28. In fact, in Judges 1, 19, we see the same verb to dispossess being used to say that Judah could not dispossess or drive out the inhabitants of the valley, quote, because they had iron chariots. Clearly, these were not surrendering. Okay, so when David claims that it was very typical for Canaanite cities to be turned into servants, it's a bit of of a claim, right? You'd say maybe maybe that's not not doing it? (laughs) Well, I mean, the narrative itself makes a huge deal of the Gibeonites, which is who I thought he was talking about at first. Mm. Uh, Yeah, me too, actually. I thought he was thinking of Gibeon. I thought so. Uh, but then a little, like, after some digging, I, I'm, I'm not sure he was. But, I mean, like, there's a, the, this is a huge deal that's made out of giving Gibeon, like, that they, they say, shit, you know, mm-hmm. that, like, we, we have fucked around, and now we are finding out, right? So they, they <laughs> put, try to put on this ruse, and they, they, they do it pretty well, right? They, they pretend to come from a far distance. So that they're not inside the land of Canaan, because the people inside the land of Canaan get so mm-hmm. they 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 come and they say, well, you know, we're, we've traveled from far, make a treaty with us. And if you read Deuteronomy uh, twenty, this is this is exactly the way that things are supposed to function, right? Well, then you know it comes out that they're actually from Canaan. It's like, God damn it, you know, uh, sorry, Yahweh, damn it, no, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I I don't know. It seemed to me, and I'd be happy for David to correct what he said or to, to clarify what he said, but the way that I understood what he was saying about Gezer and these other cities seems to be playing off of this notion that they did not dispossess them, and it just doesn't follow, uh, at least from the use of that term. The, the other thing I got from that was his mention in, I think it was of the word corvée, corvée yeah. um, which my, my understanding from looking that up is it implies temporary um, obligation. That's that's not the case, is it? Like, So it depends. And I, I, I don't know what the Hebrew <clears throat> word that's used there, although I suspect it's moss, but that's certainly what you see. It's moss. Yeah, I, mean, I would think it would be. Um, but moss, yeah, it's this idea that so the situation that's described in Deuteronomy 20, 10 to 14, I'll try to do this from memory, sorry, uh, is that if uh, when, they, when they approach a city that is far off, not inside the land of Canaan, uh, they are to offer it, the text says, offer it peace, shalom, right? Probably what this amounts to, as you can see from the context, is vassal, a vassalage, right? So you can become our vassal. And if the city accepts, then uh, everybody is like left alive, and the, the the people just become corvée labor to you. And the word that is used there is is moss. Probably what this means is like what we see Solomon doing when he musters people to build stuff for him. Right? It's a very you know common thing that you see happening. It's, All right, I want to build this project, you know, or get do, do this project. Y'all are coming to work, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Come on. Uh, so that's the that's the good that could come from that interaction for the city. The bad would be if they put up a fight, then all the men are 
killed in the city and the women and the children and all of their property become the plunder of the Israelites. So, uh, but then the text is explicit, <laughs> like it's explicit. Uh, this you are only to do for the cities that are far off. For those that are in the land of Canaan, they all <laughs> fall under the ban. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, uh, it's just eerily similar to the Mongolian invasion, like where, you know, Christians and everyone would just look at it and go, that was so messed up, where they would like march up to people and go, listen, you are going to become our, our subjects or we're going to wipe all of you out. It's that simple. And like this, this similar deal that's happening here uh, in terms of um, cultural genocide, at least. And most of the Canaanite cities were basically um, smart enough to figure out that if, if the Amorites can't hold up to... Because frankly, the Amorites had put the Canaanites under their thumb. You know, the Amorites came in with overwhelming technology and numbers to conquer Canaan. So the Canaanites were, uh, except on, say, the Shephela and the coast, and on, say, the Jordan's uh, side of the Jordan River, the Canaanites were more or less vassals or um, servants of the Amorites. This is, uh, this is very confusing. Um, I mean, first of all, is there a source for that? The Amorites who came in and overwhelmed the Canaanites with superior technology, that the Canaanites are vassals of the Amorites. Like, where is where does that come from? Uh, and then some of this, too. Like, the, he says, am I getting this right? They maintain their sovereignty specifically in the Shephala, which is on the eastern border of the, the Philistines. And then he also says... In the, the he said the Jordan side of the Jordan River, right? Which I assume to be the the Trans Jordan, um, which is weird because that's in the biblical text. That's actually the territory of Sihon, king of Heshbon, the fearsome Amorite king, who was defeated by Moses. Like, am I following hey, but, this right, or he, am I? Also, I think he also said the coast. The coast. That's right. Like, like, where does this come from? And how does it come so confidently? <laughs> this is what, honestly, this is what throws me. Sorry to interrupt you, Kip. No, I'm done. <laughs> I mean, and I, I won't say much here. I'm not an Amorite specialist, right? My friend Caleb Howard has been working on Amorite, you know, names for God. He worked on them for a while. I don't know if he's still working on them, but like th this is hotly debated. This thing about the Amorites is hotly debated. What's interesting about that debate is that usually it doesn't seem to, and it's just from the secondary literature that I've read, and I've looked at like Aaron Burke stuff. I've looked at, um, shit, what is his name? Homesure. That's, uh, I can't remember his name. Um, guy that graduated from Chicago. Anyway, um, people that work in Amorite stuff will know who I'm talking about. <laughs> They'll be shouting at the screen. All four of you watching. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like, it seems like when we get down into this part, you know, like the late Bronze Age, the discussion sort of trails off, right? Like, you know, I, I think Burke's book ends if i'm remembering correctly yeah no it could be wrong but i mean i feel like it ends around 1500 yeah. 1550 right so yeah it ends middle bronze like it's debated it's confusing even to talk about the martu you know as they existed in the at the end of the third millennium into the second millennium who are these people where are they coming from is it a is it a people proper like what is it what is it a is, is it a culture is it a coin a call like it's not my area of specialization, but I mean, holy shit, it's complicated and people debate it. Yeah. And to say like, it sounds like he's reconstructed a history here for the late Bronze Age. Yeah, it really does. I, yeah. I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> nope, that's fair. I, all I'd like to say is I'd like to see some, I'd, I'd like to see it, right? It tends to be like the main takeaway we're getting from, um, from David so far. Like, 
it's the trend is just a confidence statement that just isn't backed up and in many cases is contradicted by by what data we do have like by anyone that has knowledge in the field is like wait what what's going on and yet like to lay people you're just not going to get that it's so confidently stated um he's got away with it a couple of times with me i'm just like okay he said that so confidently i'm buying it which i know other people do when it comes to philosophy and how confidently say michael can be on philosophy when he's just not representing it uh, accurately it's a it's a problem that we detailed of course in the last episode but yeah like uh david please start giving receipts like that'd be useful yeah it seems like a pattern now there are cities that are haremed where burning is not mentioned okay like makeda okay like eglon okay mm -hmm. those are those are amorite cities that are assigned to harem again these are the foreign invaders they came in they occupied these cities and now they are fighting against the israelites so those are definitely haremed we just don't know if they were burned okay but were they occupied afterwards is probably not because they were consigned to harem so in that way burning is almost superfluous because it almost seems like harem is associated not only with say uh divine consignment to god but also to the idea that the israelites won't use the the place after it becomes a hallowed place mm -hmm. so there's going to be very few of those in israel just on a practical matter because if you devote too many cities to this where are the people going to live this is confusing to me which is why i, I understand the note that i have in here mm -hmm. because it seemed like earlier you guys can correct me if i'm just misunderstanding this it's entirely possible but it seemed like earlier the big argument was there's there's degrees yes to to the ban and so like we exactly we shouldn't expect to see these cities burned yeah but here and so like like it could be i, I guess the way that i understood what he was saying before was that these cities um would be t you just go in and you take you, you just live in them right like that's what they're going to be doing yeah so he's saying there you wouldn't expect to see this evidence of like you know it being burned down but like as you're saying like now no he's making the opposite statement that yeah you would expect. which again like and i'll say this in my in my note here both are possible hmm. well here let me just read what i wrote it seems like we have a couple of different things to consider here first what does it mean for a city to be placed under the ban uh, does it mean that if a city is placed under this ban that it could not be inhabited? This does not appear to be the case. For example, and this is what he se seemed to be saying before, uh, on the east side of the Jordan, both the regions of Sihon and Og were subjected to the ban, Deuteronomy 2 and 3, and all of the people were defeated, and the Israelites took plunder and inhabited their cities, according to the narrative. Hebron is also subjected to the ban, Joshua 10, 37 and 11, 21, Yet the city is given as an inheritance to Caleb, Joshua 14 and 15 and Judges 120. There are certainly cases in which the ban is intended to turn the city into ruins, never to be rebuilt. And you can see this in Deuteronomy 13 with like the, I think that's the, the part about the city that um, somebody, the people want them to worship a different God. Mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, Joshua 6 with Jericho, and then you can see in chapter 11 as well. But this is certainly not required by the city being placed under the ban. But I'm not sure that I understand what Falk is saying here about these Amorite cities. In Joshua 10, the five kings of the Amorites, Adonai Tzedek of Jerusalem, uh, Hohem of Hebron, Piram of Yarmut, uh, Yafia of Lachish, and Debir of Eglon, join forces to attack Gibeon. Joshua defeats them. And we know that at least Hebron was occupied, as was Jerusalem, according to the judges' tradition. Judges 1, 7, 8, and 21. In fact, Jerusalem was supposed to have been set on fire, as we see in Judges 1, 8. So I'm, honest, I'm just not sure that I'm following overall what he's arguing here yeah it, it is hard to follow along so if david if you see this you can clarify that'd be useful 
I mean, if you, what you did say, or what David just said, is that you you would expect total destruction per the definition that you gave earlier on, Kip. Like utter destruction. You don't use it. That's that's what it is to render this onto God. Okay, well, where's the evidence for that? Like that's where you would expect to see evidence, but where is it? Like you know, that's the, that's the point. That's what's going to convince people of uh, okay, maybe maybe this was happening, and this was according to as the Bible was uh, expressing. Yeah, and it, it's also, it's not going to leave the same kind of evidence as a city that's burned, like Hazor, for mm -mm. example. It's like, what are we no. supposed to find in the archaeological record here? It, uh, it's, yeah. Which we'll, we're going to get into more later when we talk about yeah. I mean, Heshbon, Dish, you know, Debone. Destruction layers, yeah, destruction layers are gifts to archaeologists, but you don't always get them. And that's a very important thing to note is that you, if you get a destruction layer, you're lucky, but you don't always get one. Igor Krimerman has written quite a bit about destruction layers during the Late Bronze Age, uh, in Canaan specifically. In his 2017 article, he summarizes the sites that show evidence of destruction during the various periods of the Late Bronze Age. In Late Bronze Age 2a, we see destruction layers at Tel Batash, level 7, Bet Shemesh, 9, Beit Mirzim, I won't list out all the levels here. Tel Harasim, Hatsur, Tel Abu Hawam, uh, Shechem, Ashdod. Anyway, a whole bunch. Uh, Ten sites total. Then 16 sites show destruction uh, during the Late Bronze 2B. I won't read all those out. And then, but it's, again, it's 16 sites. And... Finally, dating to Late Bronze Age 3, Iron Age 1A, Krimerman identified 16 sites that showed evidence of a destruction, including Dan, Yaffa, and so on. Okay. So all of these have uh, destruction layers. Another good example, albeit later than Late Bronze Age 1A transition, uh, Late Bronze Age, sorry. <clears throat> Another good example, albeit later than the Late Bronze Age Iron Age transition, is the archaeological situation surrounding Shoshank, uh, the Shawshank campaign around 920 BCE. Not the Shawshank redemption. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> in Deaver's uh, in Deaver's 2017 publication on pages 332 to 41, he presents a case against the low chronology, utilizing the 920 campaign of Shawshank. He has a chart on page 334 that shows all of the sites that have destruction levels associated with presumably this campaign. Uh, there are quite a few. In fact, he writes, quote, in the north, that is Israel, it is no coincidence that virtually every excavated site has brought to light a major destruction attributable to this and no other horizon. In short, it seems like it is not such an uncommon thing to expect destruction levels. Also, Kenneth Kitchen is often published as a biblical scholar, but his professional training and his most relevant academic work is in Egyptology. It's quite different. This is typical of a lot of evangelical scholars to do their training in tangential fields and then pass themselves off as authorities on the Bible. This is something I've noticed is very, very common in apologetics, like in philosophy as well. So someone will get a degree in what is essentially just theology, but they've done it through a philosophical um, uh, philosophical discourse. Because like some of some of theology does fall into philosophy. It's it's like philosophy and theology share like this history, and then they're presented as if like they understand epistemology when they don't. That's just not their field. Like they studied theology, they didn't study. Uh, epistemology and this is something that is very very common um in general and sometimes it's even worse like you'll get someone that's got like a like with frank turek he's got like a dean in it's not even a phd and yet he's presented as if he's an expert in physics um so this this is a this is a, is it a, a great point that you emphasize is it a in? i thought he had a phd in apologetics oh you might be right but you i could be wrong right. but uh, i i honestly don't think i also <laughs> i honestly don't think uh, a phd in apologetics is worth a lot more than a in. but uh it, yeah to be <laughs> in in any event yeah, to be fair it'd be like having a, a phd in astrology it's like okay well done yeah uh, so this is something that um old testament he's he's uh kenton sparks is a, is a professor of uh near eastern ancient near eastern studies where is he 
Um, I've got a book here. Uh, what does it say? Um, uh, Eastern University. Um, he's an evangelical uh, scholar. And he's actually addressed this very point in his really, really good book, uh, God's Word in Human Words. I believe the subtitle of the book is An Evangelical Appropriation of Critical Biblical Scholarship. And this is what he says. He says, in their efforts to confront the threat of liberal modernism in the church, academy, and society during the early 20th century, fundamentalists sent their young men and occasionally women, to universities where they could be properly credentialed and suitably trained to understand and then refute the work of modern biblical critics. In many universities, however, fundamentalist perspectives were so academically unpalatable that it was almost impossible for a theologically conservative student to study the Bible and graduate with his or her religious views intact, as was evidenced even then by the many conservative graduate students who surrendered their faith during their pursuit of a doctoral credential. Many fundamentalists avoided these difficulties by majoring in the safe discipline, textual criticism, Greek classics, ancient Near Eastern studies. Sorry, Josh or by studying in institutions where critical issues could be avoided, especially in conservative Jewish schools and in British, oh, that does say British universities. Oh, whoops. Uh, so when I think of an Old Testament scholar, um, I think of someone who spent years in training in the ancient languages, comparative literatures and cultures, the history, and in the various biblical criticisms. That's historical criticism, traditional criticism, rhetorical, literary, textual, social scientific. And to this, you know, we now have feminist, liberation, queer, colonial, postmodern, and on and on and on and on. So when what Canton Sparks is getting at and what my critique of uh of of scholars like kitchen uh like falk in the field is that when it comes to actual critical study of the bible these guys haven't done the work on in particular the 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 rigorous methodological work and the reading of the uh the the volumes of secondary literature in terms of uh how the discipline is developed and and where uh, biblical scholarship uh, comes from and where it's going. Oh, what are your brother. comments on that? She's Louise. <laughs> <sighs> I mean, last time I checked, the cities, these cities mentioned in the Bible, okay? Let's just take, you know, Pithom, Ramses, uh, Goshen, the Nile. Uh, Memphis, Heliopolis, <laughs> Pelusium, Aswan, Teresi, Pibaset. <laughs> All of these are located, uh, Pihahi wrote, uh, Balsafon, Migdal. All of these are in Egypt. The last I checked, the Israelites didn't make these up. Mm. <laughs> these are cities and locations in Egypt. Who are the subject matter experts on cities in Egypt? It's not the biblical scholars, it's the Egyptologists. And the fact is that Egyptologists have for over 150 years written on biblical topics. Okay, so this is not a new thing. I think this is to fundamentally miss the point of what Kip was saying. No one is questioning whether the fields of Egyptology, Assyriology, Archaeology, Hittitology, etc. have important and meaningful contributions to make to the field of Hebrew Bible. Of course they do. I think where we need to be careful, however, is thinking that having an expertise in an area that allows you to speak and contribute 
meaningfully to a topic in the Hebrew Bible means that you are therefore able to contribute in more or many areas. Hmm. For example, my expertise as an Assyriologist qualifies me well to speak to things, for example, related to mythological and literary intertextuality between the Hebrew Bible and Akkadian texts. However, that does not mean that I am therefore qualified to speak as an authority to the topic of Pentateuchal formation, mm. especially, especially if my conclusions and assertions run against the mainstream or consensus positions of Pentateuchal formation specialists. Yeah, this is nothing new, and I am definitely not the first one to make this point. I mean, Kenton Sparks just made this point in, uh, in, the, in the quote I offered to you before. Um, but even, even beyond that, Stephen, are you, are you familiar with this book i am not no the oxford luminary james Barr. this this uh this copy by the way i actually bought at an oxfam on uh oxford road mm -hmm. just down from uh the university of manchester so james james Barr published fundamentalism in 1977 and i believe that one of the inspirations of of this book was the work of none other than Kenneth Kitchen. Uh, I'll just read a couple of quotes to you. Mm -hmm. A very striking characteristic of conservative scholarship is that of the conservatively minded people who take an interest in the Bible, the very large proportion interest themselves academically in the margins rather than the center of the biblical field. Typically, they do not become scholars in the theology of the Old Testament or the concept of messianism or in the Pauline doctrine of faith or in the biblical concept of the covenant. Much more do they become scholars in fields like textual criticism, the grammar of New Testament Greek, archaeology in the Bible, Coptic, Semitic languages. May, many take up as their field of study, not even the periphery of biblical study, but a field which, though separate from it, has some contact with it. So, for instance, Egyptology, Assyriology, Ugaritic studies. The presence in these fields of scholars who are also religiously very conservative is a well-known fact of the present situation and one that deserves to have some discussion. Is it not strange if scholars whose personal faith is deeply anchored in the Bible and its religious authority choose to become specialists in the environment of the Bible rather than in the Bible itself or within the Bible, to become scholars of the furniture and technical mechanics of the Bible, if we may so term them, rather than in the religious heart of the Bible? So, he continues uh, to say this, In recent conservative evangelical argument, the scholar who is an expert in some environing subject, such as Egyptology or Assyriology, has come to play an increasingly important role. The lines of argument commonly placed are well illustrated by Kenneth Kitchen in his Ancient Orient and the Old Testament, published by University Press in 1966. It is argued that evidence from the ancient Near East confirms the historicity of the biblical narrative at countless points and makes the critical approaches now customary in scholarship totally unnecessary. There is no need to quote dogma, no need to indulge in heated religious controversy. One simply and calmly states the evidence from outside the Bible, which shows how unnecessary and how completely wrong the entire series of critical questionings has been. Kitchen explicitly claims that no appeal whatsoever has been made to any theological starting point in the body of his work. But the personal sense of intellectual contempt held by the writer toward critical scholars shines through everything he writes. 
and one may doubt whether the dogmatic and the personal is so far away. Appeal or no appeal to theological starting point, there is perhaps not a single book among the conservative evangelical works read in the research of this study that so fully breathes the spirit of total fundamentalism as does Kitchen's work. Damn, okay. As I noted, the uh, the the criticism of Kitchen, and this is this is what it is, right? He is a well established, uh, highly recognizable, brilliant Egyptologist. But when it comes to the Bible, when he's writing about the Bible, it becomes painfully clear that he hasn't done the work in a lot of the critical theories. Like, this is the same thing we have seen from David Falk in other presentations. Uh, he will talk about things like the documentary hypothesis in honestly some pretty embarrassingly uh, naive ways. It's, it's just, it's, it's patently obvious that so many of these guys just don't understand even the critical discussions taking place actually within the field, which is a big problem. And would you say it's because their expertise is tangential and that that's the issue? That's what's going on, at least in many of these situations. Yeah, exactly. Would you say that this is a fair analogy, right? Um, so suppose that we're talking about the foundations of the United States. And then someone said, listen, I've got a degree on the indigenous Americans. Like, and then they started listing off different locations in the US. To, and like they spoke as if this means that it is relevant to their field. Is that what David is doing here? Like, is he implying that because there's like this overlap in this way that he now is the relevant, he has the relevant expertise to talk about? Uh, the origins of the of the USA, like, is that a fair analogy, or would you say? I think so. The one thing that the thing that struck me about that, and then again, just illustrates to me that he's not well read on the broader conversations about the biblical text itself. The thing that really struck me was this sense that because all of these Egyptian places are mentioned in the biblical text it's like he's taking for granted the fact he, the the idea that the bible is just a straightforward trustworthy historical source mm. on you know these places and like that just doesn't grapple with uh the critical theories on the level that scholars do when it comes to the text and and recognizing you know redactional layers and what what uh we call the german the german term sits in labum or setting in life the social uh context for a lot of the texts that are written uh in the bible uh which also helps to explain why they get a lot of the stuff wrong when they're attempting to project backwards into into periods of time that that long uh predate the actual composition of of certain texts i'll give you a list of, of egyptologists here who have written on biblical subjects who are not evangelicals okay jan osman cr lepsius donald redford samuel sharp edward neville william f petrie Ellie Seeley, Alfred Lucas, Labib Habashi, he was a Muslim, Manfred Betok, Thomas Schneider, Wolfgang Helk, Manfred Gorg, Pierre Monte, Frank Yurko, James Weinstein, and Sarah Grohl. None of these people are, Egypt are, are evangelicals. They're all Egyptologists who have written on biblical topics. I haven't read... Uh, most of most of that most of uh, those uh, works, but I'm I would be curious to know, uh, you know, how many of them are are uh, writing with the with with the specific goal of promoting a certain historical uh, agenda 
revealed within the biblical text, right? They might be writing on on elements of uh, things that appear in the Bible or using the Bible as source material to um, uh, in in their own in in their own uh, arguments, but that's kind of a different thing than what I see someone like Kitchen doing, which is basically attempting to marshal uh, his work in Egyptology in making a strong case for you know how we should read the Bible and uh, in in pretty sharp. Uh, contrast, contradiction, and criticism of of uh, modern uh, biblical critical scholarship. So what I notice is that he listed several Egyptologists who have written on biblical topics, but discussing biblical themes. So it could be like, you know, uh, comparisons with mythology or ca comparisons in many other ways. But the specific context here is addressing the conquest of Canaan. It's, it's a specific type. So unless all those names he listed are actually doing what he's doing here, the relevant uh, the relevance to them strikes me as a little a little unfair. Um, but I, I mean, like Kip, your point, your main point, isn't that Egyptologists shouldn't speak on biblical matters, yeah. but that apologists often obtain degrees in tangential fields and then present themselves as experts in biblical studies. That is exactly what David does. Whereas Michael doesn't even have a tangential degree, and yet he goes on to Gavin's show and makes these statements, these controversial statements, that are against what the scholar, scholarly consensus is. And that is your point. The very point that you were stating, of course, is exactly what Michael was doing, and it's exactly what David is doing. This is nothing but professional hedge protection. That's all this is. And, you know, it's just, oh, we're the expert on anything biblical. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's so much cross-cultural, like, I don't know if contamination is the right word, but I mean, well, like, there's cross well, like, what do you, what do you expect? The Bible, the Bible's not restricted just to Israel. It yeah. covers a lot of geography outside of Israel. It covers Mesopotamia, it covers Babylon, it covers Persia, it covers Turkey, and it covers Egypt. Hmm. This is why cognate specialists have always had a place in writing about the Bible. Because those areas which with, with which we are familiar with, we are empowered to write on. And I, I would absolutely agree with him on that last statement, but I think what he said here kind of illustrates uh, why an Egyptologist's opinion about the Bible might be questioned by actual biblical scholars. So false statements here about place names in the Bible presumes, right? It presumes that the Bible is inherently accurate about these places. And this just fails in view of contemporary critical biblical scholarship. Yeah. What people like Falk and Kitchen struggle to see is that the Bible in its entirety is an Iron Age or later book written by cultural elites probably living in Jerusalem. And because they lack the training in the methods and the theory of biblical criticism that have developed over the last 200 years, they fail to see that something like the book of Joshua is not a record of the late Bronze Age conquest. It is rather an idealized, uh, it is rather idealized propaganda of the late 7th century. And because of this, Biblical scholars are not especially interested in the place names in the book of Exodus beyond how these were written and read in Josiah's Judean kingdom and beyond. There are There is actual evidence for this, like actual evidence for uh, the, the place and the development of the book of Joshua at this later point in time. You will notice that uh, in the book of Ezra, for example, and Nehemiah, written sometime during or after the Persian period, the, these books use tropes developed in the conquest narratives to promote their own isolationist puritanical ideologies. You see this in, in Ezra chapter 9, for example. And yet these are the only texts in the Hebrew Bible which seem to be even familiar 
with Joshua. Like, think about that for a minute. If this is something that was composed and compiled, you know, around the time of the beginning of the Judean kingdom, one might think that in the subsequent literature that followed on the, the composition of that, someone might might show that they know something or recognize something about the book of Joshua, but that doesn't happen. Not until this much, much later period of time. Of course, fundamentalists like Kitchen or Falk or Jones, I know I know Jones in particular is not a fundamentalist. Uh, they're not interested in any of that because their confessional pre-commitment to the they have a they have sorry uh, they have a confessional pre-commitment to the historicity of the text. And I, like I suspect uh, Falk would say he's not. I mean, I know he would say he's not a fundamentalist either. I know he's he would say he's not a fundamentalist. But either. I think I think the reason that this sort of thing comes up is that there seem to be things that that align there with with fundamentalist thinking but mm -hmm. i i, I want to kind of i know this is this is sort of the end of this section but i want to kind of close out this with with dealing with two things one uh, expertise and two consensus mm -hmm. so i want to say uh that david and um michael made a i think a very good critique of us in their latest video and i haven't watched the whole thing I know, Kip, I don't think you've you've watched. I'm not sh sure. I haven't watched any of it, no. <laughs> but they made a very good critique, and I think you'll stand with me on this, where they said that we say all the time when, it, when we're talking about things like the documentary hypothesis or things like this, the archaeology of the conquest, that we are not subject matter experts. It's why we just had Ami Haimazar yeah. on the channel. Um, but that in the Polygia video... Paula Gia said about us, I bring on, and he specifically said, I went back and listened to it, subject matter experts, exactly what he said. Yeah. That is a yeah, very is. fair critique. Yep. And uh, like, I should have paid more attention to that and I should have said, hey, let's let's edit that to have something else. Um, so good call, yep. like good point. I agree. And so let's let's, let me be clear here, what my position, what I think Kip's position is. Um, what we do online, primarily, unless we're dealing with things that we have uh, a specialization in from our doctoral work, or something that we've read through the primary and secondary literature enough that we feel confident. I still, in that case, don't say that I'm an expert on it. In fact, I, I, I don't know how often I say that I'm an expert on any fucking thing, but um, because there's always 10 people that are much better at me than it. So anyway, but the point is that we constantly appeal to and cite and do research and present the work of people that are subject matter experts. If we're going to talk about the formation of the Pentateuch, you bet your bottom dollar we're going to be quoting people like Baden and Schmidt and... Stackert. And, and yeah, I mean, uh, it cross out like we're not sitting there and name all these people. But we're going to name... And if we're going to talk about the archaeology of the conquest, I mean, just watch the fucking video. Like we cite scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar. There's a whole reason we do that because it's not just us saying it because all we're doing is looking to the subject matter experts and saying, okay, what is it that they're saying now in the field and why are they saying it? But this brings me to point number two, and it's something that David said in this last stream, and I want to make sure that he and everybody else is very, very clear about what we do here. He made the statement that was akin to, I'm going to try to get as close as I can, Bowen is a consensus scholar he draws his conclusions based on what does the consensus say, not on what does the data say. And I understand that this might be difficult to see, but that is bullshit. <laughs> and I want to make sure that it's clear because I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that that is crystal clear from the way that I present things, right? Maybe it's not. Maybe I, because I say so often, look, I'm not a subject matter expert in this. Here's what the consensus says. I say that a lot. 
But if you read any of my work or you watch any of my videos, and Kip is exactly the same way in this, like go read my chapter on the dating of the book of Daniel, Mm -hmm. right? Or read the book on slavery. What it is that I'm saying is, look, here's the consensus position on this thing that like just everybody is that's a subject matter expert is agreeing this is the case. Now, here's why they say that. And the whole chapter lays out all of the data, right, that we have concerning this issue. So there's a difference between the consensus says it, therefore it must be right. Nobody's making that argument. No. Sorry if it seems that way. Nobody's making that argument. What we are saying, though, is that here's what the consensus is saying. This is why they're saying it. If you're going to hold to a a position that the consensus isn't holding to, you're going to argue for that, then you've got to make your case. And if you're not a subject matter expert in that topic, it doesn't lend a lot of credibility to the research that you're doing. Doesn't mean that you're wrong. No. But as David said so many years ago, he has to be selective about what books he reads. That's why he didn't read mine, because it wasn't peer-reviewed. And I said when he said that, yeah, I agree, right? That's probably a conclusion that I would have come to because if it's not peer reviewed, you got to, you got to cut off somewhere. Can't read everything. Right. But of course that wasn't the point of me writing my book. That's, that's, it's not, it's not meant to be peer reviewed because even, even though there were scholars that read it. But anyway, the point is that, um, that's what we mean by experts and why that's important and consensus. That's what we mean and how we use it. Well, that's the thing though. Like, okay, fair enough. Um, at the beginning, um, Paul made a statement on, on your expertise and you got it wrong. Fair enough. But the, if you watch the video, which apparently they have, then every time you are stepping anywhere, anywhere near outside of your expertise, you're, you're caveat, you, you, you caveat it to, frankly, it could be an annoying degree, right? But, but that is the point of trying to go, look, I need to make clear, this is transparent. This is where I'm walking now. These are my views. But I'll tell you what, I'll give you receipts. And if I'm going against scholarly consensus, I'll damn well make sure you know it because it's my due diligence to do this. That is absent, completely absent in what David's doing. It's a complete difference. And it's absent in what apologetics do in general. This goes to your point earlier on, Kip. This is what happens with people that get tangential degrees. They speak with utter conviction and confidence in areas that they don't have the necessary um, yeah. expertise to do so. And and they don't show receipts. They just say it. They just say it. They don't have receipts. We've seen that with David today uh, on many occasions. We've seen it with Michael all the time. It's, it is just a feature in apologetics. And when they do make statements that are completely against what the consensus is, and the consensus is a damn important thing. It, it doesn't mean it's that's that's the way it should be, but it is something that you should take serious because peer disagreement is something that should be taken seriously. Um, when you, none of that comes across from watching Michael, from walk, watching apologists, from watching Frank Turek, from watching William Lane Craig, every statement that these apologists make that is against what the consensus is, that is actually very controversial, that is quite far away from where they have areas of expertise. None of it comes free at all. And it's a complete contrast to what you see with actual scholarship, in my opinion, which is even though on Paul Agia's, um, uh episode, he, he, pre- he presents you as an expert in a field that you're not. Um, if you just watch the content, it's quite clear that you're making, making it, you, are, you make it clear many times over that you're not an expert in that, in that area. It's just, just such a crucial point that you raised there. And that's the problem. That's that's one of the, my largest problems of apologetics altogether. Honestly, like, I, I think just, just to sort of bring this back full circle here, um, the reason we made that video in the first place, uh, the video with Apologia, is because of that statement that Michael said mm. in in the uh, in, in at the beginning of his interview with Gavin, there is overwhelming evidence for the conquest of Canaan. (laughs) Now, the whole point of making that video was to show 
to discuss what scholars are saying about the conquest of Canaan and why they are saying it. Like Josh and I are, yeah, we're absolutely not specialists in uh, uh, Israelite origins or in archaeology, Levantine archaeology, certainly not Egyptology. We're not specialists in in, in these fields. Uh, but what we are is public promoters, popularizers of critical biblical scholarship. And I think one of the things that we are uh, capable of doing, if not providing an expert opinion, is to be able to distill what the experts are saying. At least I hope that's what we're doing uh, competently, so that people get a sense of, uh, of, of what they're saying and why they're saying it. Now, are you going to trust a couple of guys who have had years and years and years of training in the languages, in the methods, and in the, uh, in the history of critical biblical scholarship to deliver you this information? Or are you going to trust um, a guy with a, a, a philosophy degree and an Egyptologist? Yeah. And if you're going to go for the latter, that you think that you should get some receipts from people that actually do have expertise in this area, especially if it's going against the consensus. And I guess like to, to wrap it all up, if, if you, the way that David and Michael are selling it is this. There is overwhelming evidence that the conquest of Canaan happened. However, most scholars, especially critical scholars, don't believe it. And the reason they don't believe it hinges on, well, very bad evidence, because the evidence is overwhelmingly the case that it did happen. So the bad evidence, for instance, is they expect to see bodies in the room. Like, do you really think that most scholars yeah. are thinking this? Like, this, this is, if this should come across as a major red flag in their reasoning their their very model is is so so transparently corrupt and false and and such a straw man that like come on you gotta see for it is what is what i would say to people like that that that, sh that alone should serve to go yeah this you ain't accurately representing this correctly on that bombshell i think uh i think that's time to wrap up on that one that was awesome josh <laughs> <laughs> really was, yeah. uh, man. I, I think you guys are. Uh, this, these these are always great, always great. Stephen, thank you for having us back on. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Honestly, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time, uh, everyone watching. Check out the links below. You can see their books. You can see links to their channels. Um, do check it out. And yeah, just thanks. I'm looking forward to the next one.